Hello again. What's going down? Filter free America listeners. How you doing guys? Joey Vincent back in your ears, creeping through the crevices of your mind. My voice is engaging into your brain and whatever weird way that the human body allows voice to travel through like uh, your, your ear cavity your ear canal into I, I know there's a drum in there I guess it plays on the drum or something I don't really know biology or anything and then it goes into your brain and your brain processes what I'm saying and uh that process is either going to result in like a positive feeling of oh finally I get to hear his voice again or a negative feeling like holy shit how the fuck did this get on let's turn this shit off and one of those two things is going to happen I'm not sure which one it is Hope it's the ladder. Is that the first ladder? No, wait. I think ladder is the last. I think it's the first one where I, where it's positive. That's what I think. I, I, that's what I'm hoping for. Whatever. I hope you're enjoying hearing my voice. I hope you're enjoying hearing this podcast. I hope you're enjoy, enjoying hearing uh, uh, the the shows that I'm putting together for you. I'm enjoying putting them together. Uh, I'm getting lots of positive response from many people, so I know some people are enjoying it. I've yet to get a bad uh, message yet. I haven't got anybody saying, "Hey, this show sucks." Show sucks. Show show fucking blows. Why don't you why don't you not do this show anymore? I'm trying to think of a of a of a troll insult. Uh, your show is garbage. That's not what they say. They say something meaner because it's the internet. Hey faggot, your show sucks. That's not me saying that. That's me talking the voice uh, of a troll. Uh, you know, insulting you on the internet because that's when things like that are said. You know, wouldn't say that word other than doing an impression of people who are hateful and mean, and use that as an insulting term. Anyway, that's a long way for me to say welcome to the show. Whatever, we're here. Hey, we're still sponsored. We still have a sponsor. Can you believe that? Haven't fucked that one up yet. That's amazing. Can't believe it. This is, this is a great relationship I have with my uh, show sponsor, my only show sponsor so far. Best relationship I've had since my probation officer. This is really good. Uh, show sponsor, a Simple Website. Simple website. I know it's kind of a weird name. I know you're thinking simple website. Is he is he making a, a declarative statement about the uh, complexity of a website? No, I'm talking about the name of the company that sponsors the show. Simple website. That's their name. They wanted their name to 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 project what they offer, and that is you a simple solution for your website, right? Okay, you guys know Squarespace, right? Everybody knows Squarespace. Squarespace is a website b- building thing, and if you're if you got all the free time in the world and you're 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 good at that kind of stuff, pretty easy to build your own website. But guess what? Some people can't do that. Some people either a don't have the free time to to learn how to build a website, or B, some people like myself, uh, kind of dumb, kind of dumb, yeah. So what, what people like we do, uh, dumb people like myself, busy people like yourself, we go to simplewebsite.us, simplewebsite.us, and you go to their website, right? And what they do there is everything. Right. They do everything. OK, this is the place. This is the one stop shop. This is everything you need when it comes to building your Squarespace website, because these guys have mastered the art of of Squarespace website building. Right. They have learned every every trick, every 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 uh, every hack there is every, every every skill that you could need to build a squarespace website they know it they have they have done it they have analyzed it from the ground up they have they have made up some shit right they they don't you know they they just they they come up with it man they they they've they've practiced and uh, they developed their skills and talents and now they're offering it up to you to make w- uh, website building on squarespace a much easier process okay now get this you can go to their website right and they have free sources like tips and video courses, boom, right there for you. That's free. I think, I'm pretty sure when it says free, it's in my notes right here. 
is one of the bullet points I'm supposed to read. Free resources like tips and video courses. Pretty sure they mean free when it says free, okay? Just take it. Just go to their website. I don't know why they're doing giving away for free. I would charge you at least, you know, 10, 15 cents, something, right? But no, these guys at, at Simple Website, they're like, yeah, I was giving it to them for free. Because well, you know why? You know why they're giving it for free? Because they have so much other stuff to offer. They're like, uh, they're like uh, Ron Jeremy, you know, the, the porn star, Ron Jeremy, right? Like, I heard that he'll, he'll like, like put the tip in for free because he knows he has so much other amount of dick to put inside of you that he'd just give you some tip for free, right? Yeah, and he only charges you when he gets past the tip because that's where the money is, right? That's basically what I'm assuming Simple Website is doing by giving away free sources uh, like tips and videos. Uh, that's my words. That's not their script that they gave me. So uh, hold me accountable for that if that offends you in any kind of way. Uh, also, expert screen, screen, share, screen, share? screen share support to help you when you get stuck. Expert screen share support. Not amateur screen share support. Expert screen share support to help you when you get stuck. Pretty sure that only applies to your website, though. Uh, I don't think it's like a life thing. You know, like you're, if you're somewhere and you're, you're out and about and you for some reason you have to write a check, you know, I don't know why you'd have to write a check, but you forgot how because nobody writes checks anymore and you just can't like log on and ask for some help on how to write a check. Right. I'm pretty sure you can't do that. But I think it's all about websites They they offer expert screen share support to help you when you get stuck. OK. Also, if you just want it from the ground up, you don't want to do anything. You're like, hey, simple website uh, people. Uh, I'm an idiot just like Joey, okay? Uh, or I'm just super busy and I've got other things to do. Or I've just got money laying around and I just want to make websites or whatever. Uh, they offer professional design service. You just hire someone and they build the site for you, right? It's like they become your 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 employee, right? You just throw them a couple, a couple bucks, right? And they build it. You tell them, I want this and I want it to look like that, and I want it to do this. Now, you build it. You do it now. You make me happy, simple website people, and they do it. That's why they do it. I don't know. Uh, I, I'll tell you what. It's, it's, we're working on it now. I've got a meeting tonight at 8.30 on the phone, right, because that's how the way things are done right now because these guys are in another part of the country, and uh, we're going to uh, talk about my website and uh, some of the final, final touches and stuff. But I'm telling you right now, when you guys see it, it's dope. Looks it looks it looks good, uh, m better than I could have ever done, ever possibly could have done, uh, on Squarespace on my own. Like if I would have built my own Squarespace website, it would have looked a lot like like MySpace. That's what it would <laughs> look like, and like like not even what even MySpace looks like today, but like what MySpace would have looked like, you know, like uh, you know, two thousand one, two thousand two, you know, just a bunch of glitter graphics. And things like that. That's what it would <laughs> would have looked like. But it's gonna look dope. But uh, hopefully, in the next uh, end of this week, beginning of next week, uh, I, I'll be able to debut that website. You'll be able to see it publicly. It's gonna be it's gonna be super cool. Uh, but yeah, go to simplewebsite.us. Simplewebsite.us. Check out the website. See what they have to offer. And uh, yeah, it'll make your life much easier when it comes to building websites. Um, uh, what else do we want to talk about here before I talk about the show? Oh yeah, hey, guess what? Still not on iTunes as of the recording of this intro to this podcast. Uh, I think I've uh, been attempting to get uh, uh, submitted on iTunes for over two weeks now. I think we're going about two weeks, two and a half, uh, maybe not a, quite a half, two and a half, whatever. It's over two weeks. Right, iTunes still having technical problems, uh, and they they were playing dumb when I when I messaged the support like oh yeah we're working on it we're just so busy over here you know counting money uh, but we're definitely getting to your problem and I, so and I googled I went on Google it's a thing if you don't know what it is it's a thing that you can look up it's got all the answers it, and I it googled problems that were similar to mine and guess what. Surprise, surprise, there are many other people trying to submit podcasts having the exact same issue. Uh, so, yeah, I don't know what's going on with iTunes. It's apparently a thing when some people submit podcasts for approval to the almighty iTunes uh, uh, registry of podcasts that sometimes some stuff goes wacky. So, again, my apologies, iTunes listeners. Uh, if you're having to listen to the show via a source that you don't normally like to listen to or not your 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 uh preferred podcast outlet i'm fucking trying i am i sent a very strongly 
uh, a emotionally laden uh, three paragraph email to the support team at uh, uh, iTunes yesterday, laying it all on the table. I told them, I'm like, look, look, I get it. You guys are over there. Uh, you know, you guys are, are a billion dollar company, and I'm over here. I'm just a struggling comedian trying to put it together, trying to create a product, to try to get a little bit of exposure, try to have some fun in the process and doing it. And, uh, uh, yeah, you, you, don't, you don't feel my pain the way I feel my pain. I get it, okay? But look, I got money invested in this. I got time invested in this. I got other people's time invested in this and other people's money invested in this. Uh, I need you to uh, do whatever you got to do to help get this process going. And here's the deal. I, I even asked him, I was like, hey, you know, my RSS feed, that's a fancy word for the thing that makes the podcast go, uh, we know it works because I'm on all these other podcast outlets, Stitcher, Google Play, uh, TuneIn, et cetera, right? So we know that works. That's not the problem. We know it's on your end. Why can't I just give you my RSS feed via this email, right? And you just submit it for me on your end because apparently it's the communication problem between the you know, where I'm at and where you're at, you know, that kind of thing. I don't know. They told me they couldn't do that. They said, I, that's not something I can do. Uh, I don't know why. They didn't tell me why they couldn't do that. Uh, I asked them why they couldn't do that. I've yet to get a response for that. That seems very fishy to me. I don't know. Maybe it's a grand conspiracy uh, to keep filter-free America away from iTunes listeners. Whatever. I don't know. But I'm working on it. So that's what it is. Anyway, let's talk about the show. Let's talk about this episode. Hold on a second. Let me take a drink here. Sorry, I was parched. A lot of rambling this morning. It's early. I'm recording this. Um, this episode. This is going to be a, a very interesting episode from a lot of different angles, okay? Uh, my guest, uh, his name is Sean. I'm not going to give you his full name here because he does a, uh, a lot of, <laughs> uh, of admitting to a lot of things uh, that he did earlier in his life. Uh, that may may still be uh, uh, things he could get legally prosecuted for, so... We're going to go by Sean, okay? And uh, before I go into some of the details here, the, one of the cool angles of this is, is Sean and I uh, uh, were friends, uh, have been friends for a very long time. Sean and I uh, were friends before I was in to stand-up comedy. Sean and I uh, met when I first moved to uh, the Minneapolis area, when I first moved here with aspirations of uh, uh, becoming uh, a hip-hop and R&B music management type person that was the the industry i first attempted to for the entertainment industry i first attempted to, to break into and when i first moved up here i uh i uh, basically s seeked out rap acts that i liked and wanted to work with and wanted to help produce and promote and just try to self-teach and and try to you know to basically discover an act and i and i would go out and i would go to venues and i would you know i would go to areas in the hood and and talk to people and and uh, who were into music and and have conversations, and listen to what they were doing, and I and I put a collective of you know rappers together, and I paid for studio time, and I was like, look, here's some beats I bought, here's a studio, there's a microphone, let's let's record you, and uh, let's we'll see if we could make something happen, and I I, I wasted uh, thousands of dollars <laughs> doing that, but in the process, I had a lot of good time doing it. But of all the people that I that I recorded. Uh, Three artists in particular, uh, uh, they went by uh, Joey Brown, uh, Sean P., and uh, Big Rico, uh, were uh, head and shoulders more talented than any of the others. And uh, so eventually I got to the point where I was uh, focusing on them. They were the only group I was focusing on, uh, you know, all the studio time, all the promotion time, everything else. And they were really, really good. And I'm not, I, I can't stress that enough. Um, how good of of a uh, uh, performers that they were, uh, how good of uh, uh, rappers that they were, uh, it, it was it was excellent, and uh, and we really really tried. You know, they were, they were booking shows, they were getting you know recording really good tracks, and uh, it just you know the only reason it didn't work I think is just because I ran out of money. I think I got frustrated. We had, you know, it is what it is. It doesn't always work out regardless of talent, and that's why it didn't. It didn't continue and why I moved on to other things and and uh, some of them did too. Uh, but anyway, that's how I know Sean. And that actually will come up in the interview and we'll we'll touch on that briefly a little bit. But uh, outside of that, 
Sean, also a, a white guy in the hood himself. The other two guys in the group, uh, Rico and uh, and Joey Brown, uh, were, were black dudes. I don't know if that matters. Just trying to, to uh, paint the picture here more clearly. Right? Uh, Sean, again, white guy like myself, kind of had the same background as myself. White guy in the hood, involved in a lot of illegal stuff in the hood, and lived a very... Uh, dramatic dyma- uh, dynamic lifestyle there uh, earlier part of his life and so that's basically what we're going to talk about today he's going to kind of give me uh, a, a snapshot of uh, uh, the crazy stuff that happened in his life some things I knew about some things I didn't know about and uh, some things I'm going to learn about in a lot more detail than uh, than I knew before here's another thing when we sat down to record this uh, ended up being uh, just over two hours worth of podcasts. Okay, I, I don't know where you guys are at or at listener, as listeners right now with this show, and uh, I, I don't know if if you guys are really comfortable with sitting down and listening to a over almost. Let's be honest, it was going to be an almost three hour episode uh, of this show if I didn't edit anything. And normally, I don't like to edit. Normally, I like to you know push record, whatever happens, push stop, whatever happens, and that's it. But too long. I didn't want to take the chance of it being too long, and I wanted to make sure that everybody listened to the 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 good stuff. So what I'm going to do is I trimmed a little bit off the beginning, I trimmed a little bit off the end, and we've still got basically an hour and a half ish amount of of interview, right? And uh, in the beginning, I'm going to tell you what you missed in the beginning, and at the end, I'm going to tell you what you missed at the end, just to kind of wrap it up, you know, and just to kind of set it up, you know. And that, and that, trust me, and that saved literally almost an hour. And uh, yeah, I think it's going to make for a better podcast. But I don't know. You you guys are the boss. You guys uh, message me, uh, find me on Facebook, find me on Twitter, find me on Instagram, uh, or just email me at filterfreeamerica at gmail.com. America spelled with a K, filterfreeamerica, America spelled with a K at gmail.com. And if you want that free form, absolutely no editing. Whatever comes out, comes out. I mean, if I get enough people that are interested, you know, that's fine. But uh, I don't know. I, I just think it was better this way. Just try to make for a better product. Okay, so um, what, did, what did I edit out in the beginning? I'm going to edit I'm going to tell you about the beginning stuff at the end and whatever. Uh, but just know I left the good stuff in there. And when I say good stuff, I mean uh, if you're into drug stories, we've got drug use, we've got drug dealing, we've got drug cooking, we've got drug arrests. Uh, there's sex in here. There's pimping in here. There's robbery in here. Uh, there's even, surprise, surprise, uh, a story about impersonating an NBA player. So, yeah, this is going to be a, an action-packed, uh, full of debauchery, full of of hood life drama uh uh, there's shootings, there's, there's, ro- oh man, it's, it's, it's a little bit of everything, right? It's, this is a, a crazy story. So definitely a lot in there. Okay. So what did I cut out? I just kind of cut out the beginning story. Uh, you know, he was three years old. His dad left at a very early age, which maybe had an impact on some of his decision-making skills. Uh, surprise, uh, his dad, uh, was a former cop, a former, uh, cop in, uh, South Dakota, uh, who was also abusive to his mom. He uh, left the family when uh, when Sean was just three and uh, kind of left to fit on his own. He started, you know, started doing drugs at again of an early age. I think, uh, well, he's, I think he said maybe around 11 or something like that. I think that's kind of where we start to pick up. It was right around that 11 range, 11, 12-year-old range. We start to pick up there. So that's, that's basically all we, we cut out there. You, you know the get-go, broken home, boom. We jump into the interview, and at the end, I'll give you the the happy ending or sad ending uh, at the at the end of the interview. And again, that's just going to save a bunch of time or whatever. So, uh, what are we going to call this episode? Uh, Sean, he's a white guy, white guy in the hood doing gangster stuff. Uh, I, I think there's only really one name we can call it, and that is. Uh, oh yeah, that's got to be it. That's going to be it. Okay, here we go. I've got it already. Uh, Here we go. Filter Free America, episode number five, White Boys in the Hood. Here we go. There was really only kind of like two sides of people in school. It were 
the the good kids and then it, like the kids that got good grades and did what their parents told them and played sports and whatever and then there was the fucking burnouts that were you know like skateboarders like me and didn't do shit except skateboard and wanted to get high and like try to touch someone's boob you know <laughs> So that that was all kind of junior high, high school. You graduated high school? No. Okay. Dude, I went through seven different high schools and never graduated. Getting in trouble? It, yeah. yeah. Oh yeah, dude. I mean, well, through that party life, you know, you like I discovered I discovered women, you know, and I think it, that was that was a hard turning point in my life. <laughs> like discovering vagina for the first time was like the caveman discovering fire. <laughs> It was just like this unbelievable moment in one's life. And, you know, like that, I think, formed and shaped the rest of my schooling career, which was focused primarily on after school antics. You right. know what I mean? Like getting high. Fuck algebra. There's some pussy right, to be dude. had. Dude, I'm trying to like finger bang somebody for the first time, you know, and like thought that was what's up is you just. <laughs> Like, if I could make out with somebody and touch a tit and maybe slip a finger in there, like, I was doing it. It's a good day. It's a full day's work. Fuck, That's dude. When I, I was 13, dude. I was 13 when I lost my virginity. Holy shit, dude. Yeah, I was young. I so was super late. Yeah, I, I just, you know, like, at, and again, you discover pussy, and it it's, changes your life, you know? I, I guess some, most people, I should right. say, you know? Yeah. Like, I mean, for me, it was just, it was, it was about having fun you know and i in my life my life at home was never fun you know so i think i sought that outside of my home life was just to like be like fuck it i'm just gonna have as much fun as i can and you know i'm gonna get fucked up and just live you know and no direction no none of that shit and and you know it it, it grew from there so that's not totally unheard of the the you know drugs and farting even at that young of age but when did the the hustle mentality start to creep in and why what what when did you yeah so i you you obviously you know as well as the discussion will go we'll find out how skilled you were at that you were very skilled at it when did you feel the need to need to start hustling? Why did you need to start hustling? And what was your first? <clears throat> That's a good question. And, and you know, like I've never really understood why I have that kind of mentality to hustle. I don't, I don't know. I think that's something that one is just probably given at birth, you know, it's, it's just like a genetic gene or some shit is embedded in your DNA that, that you get or you don't, you know? And, um, uh, when I was young, you know, I started partying and then, you know, you, you, you're going to these house parties with all these kids and, you know, I became like the guy that people would, you know, get shit from. And then it was like, it wasn't an intentional thing. I fell into it, but I was just like, Tell I just like, wanted like weed. Yeah. Like weed. just selling weed, you know, is like, I just wanted everybody to have a good time, you know? So I started off and I just sold weed and then that started off in in like my junior high years and it went through high school and then I got better at it, you know, and it made more. There's a skill. You gotta yeah. Learn. Yeah. I'd like develop my first life skill. And where, where were you getting your first sellable amounts of weed? How did you get your first plug? Dude, you know what's funny is I got kicked out of one of my schools and I'm, I'm not going to mention the school, but I got kicked out of this school for selling weed. And what's funny is, oh, fuck, dude, that's going to give it away. All right. Well, it, it it is what it is. So I went to uh, – oh, here, I'll leave it like this. Ragnar, do you remember the, the Minnesota Vikings, right? Yeah. Ragnar was like the, uh, the, the official mascot for right. a long time, right? Ragnar worked at this school in the lunchroom. He worked in like the lunchroom attendant, which was, which was cool as fuck for a kid, right? But he, I used to like – to answer your question, the first time I sold weed and after the few, the first probably like 10, 15 times, I actually didn't sell weed. I sold fucking oregano to this kid <laughs> who the, fir the first kid I sold weed to is actually, I ended up beating him up later in life, oddly enough, which was fucked up too. 
Uh, but <laughs> yeah, I sold this kid some dime bags uh, of uh, oregano. All right. And that was that was it. Like that was my first go around at business. <laughs> And then I just kind of was it's like, short term hustle. Right yeah, there. I was like, holy shit, though. Like, this is easy. <laughs> like, I could go into my pantry and make money. So I turned that into like legit hustle with everybody else that I partied with. You right. Know? And I started making money. Did he realize it after the fact? Did he, did he come back to school the next day? Man, that was some really good weed. I think he, yeah, I don't know. I, like think, I think he was just starting out too. And it was like, he didn't know what to expect. So I don't know if it was like the fucking placebo effect or right. what, you know, but like I, it definitely was not weed, you know, but then I got smart after of, of probably like 10 times and I did put a little bit of swag in the bag, <laughs> you know, so it was like a tenth. What do you cut your weed with, oregano? <laughs> yeah, dude. I mean, it just smelled like you were cooking pasta. But, right. You know what I mean, like it wasn't fucking weed. But why does it smell like pizza? It's Italian weed. Yeah, man. It comes in from Italy. I mean, that was my that was my it's first mafia. that was my first hustle. And like, I think when you can make money off of your mom's kitchen cabinet, like you really think life is gonna be fun <laughs> and easy. You know, like I was like, well, shit. If I can make, you know, twenty dollars off of a two bottle you know two dollar bottle of oregano right turn it legit you know and so that's what i did and it 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 just blew up from there <laughs> so when was your first major hustle then what, what what age was that you said that was teens 11 12 13 yeah so like i developed up through the whole you know like selling weed to your friends and shit and i got kicked out of all of these schools for just being a nuisance and you know either like selling drugs or fighting or you know all of that so after all the schools and stuff i think i just kind of discovered that like the full-time hustle was a lot easier for me and that's what I did. I focused on, you know, like not school, but just partying and developing my my clientele, you know. And then um, like my my first real hustle like started probably like 16, you know, when I was pushing like pounds, a couple of pounds every, you know, couple weeks, you know, so maybe like a pound a week or so. And I think that's when... You know, I was making good money. You're 16, and you're like, dude. You know, most people aren't even like working at selling pizza. You know, yet it's they don't even have a fucking job. Like Taco Bell's off the radar. Right. And I was, you know, just selling weed. You know, and like started making pretty legit money at like 16. But I did get my first job, oddly enough, at a pizza joint. <laughs> and I used to like. True story. The first time I ate mushrooms was when you had I an was, unlimited supply of <laughs> dude, fake weed. At that dude, time. No, like, like not the first time I ate like mushrooms on a pizza, but like for real, like hallucinogenic mushrooms right. was at this pizza joint in a delivery. <laughs> like, I went on delivery with this dude, like who was much older, and I thought was super fucking cool, you know. And like he smoked cigarette or no, he didn't even smoke cigarette. He chewed. So you're like, Hey, we just had a chew in. Right. And I thought that was like, man, this dude's fucking doing it. You know? <laughs> he had a Pontiac fucking like sunfire or something. Right. You know? I was like, damn, this dude's or like a grand dam. It was, you know, I was like, right. damn, he's got a fucking little, like wannabe sports car, some chew, some chicks. I was like, wow, he's doing it, you know? But then he gave me mushrooms for my first time and it took me out on deliveries. And I got super, super fucked up. And I remember like he stopped, he was, he was of age. So he stopped at the liquor store. And I remember like <laughs> sitting in front of this liquor store and on the way back to go drink, you know, right. So like we just ate mushrooms, but we're delivering pizza and then to go back and then drink after hours, you know? <laughs> um, but I'm sitting in front of this liquor store and like, I get my first set of visuals for mushrooms <laughs> off of the like for sale signs on 40 ounces. And yeah, it was, it was crazy. Wow. Yeah. So 16, 17 years old, your dad comes back in your life, right? Is that right? Yeah. Yeah. So my dad disappears. And at 17, he ends up coming back into my life, which was kind of crazy. Cause like I, I was talking to my mom one day and 
through just like conversation and kind of just joking around, I made a comment, something like, I bet you I could find him. And we were talking about him and, you know, and she was like, no, I don't think so. And I ended up like tracking him down somehow. I don't remember how at the time, I honestly don't, it was so long ago, but I ended up finding him. I think it was through like another family member or something like that. And, um, he lived in a trailer park out in South Dakota. And so I called him and like, that was the first contact we'd had in probably like six, seven years. Mm -hmm. Like he, he would call and tell me he was going to come pick me up. You know, he would do that shit (laughs) for like, no, no, he would do that shit though. From like three to when I was probably like six, you know, seven. And then he gave up. And then, so coming back into my life in at that time uh, was crazy because, like, yeah, I found him. He's at this trailer park. He's got this life, and I wasn't part of it, you know. And so, um, my did you did you feel let <clears throat> let down that you weren't in the life of the trailer court with him? That seems like a. I mean, I didn't even care about the trailer. Like, I think as a kid, your your mission in life is you just like, especially if you're a guy, like you just want your dad, right? You know, like you 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 want that kind of shit in your life you know you want to be able to fish you want somebody to take you fucking fishing you know what i mean like and and teach you how to like fucking take a piss and like like a man you know and (laughs) and fucking make beef jerky and do like gnarly shit that a lot of people like you know just think of man like now i just grew a beard because it's manly you know it's (laughs) fucking and that's what you want when you're a kid and like you don't get that and you don't get that attention it's that that's tough you know but um so yeah like this is the first contact i've had with him in like god knows how many years so what was the conversation like what was... <clears throat> super awkward you know like it was really like fumbling footballs over and over and over again you know it was just super weird but my mom actually steps up big time, right? And, like, reluctantly tells me, she's like, if you want to see him, you know, and, and it, like, yeah, keep in mind, like, this is the first, like, time I'm really going to spend time with him and shit, you know? So she offered to fly me out to South Dakota for, like, it was, like, close to a week and see this fucking guy, you know? And she bought the plane ticket, you know? Like, although this dude never paid child support was a fucking grade a piece of shit you know and she like still for my sake let me and paid for me to go out and see this dude right so i hop on a fucking plane and i go and i meet this guy face to face in the trailer park and i thought this dude was fucking Man, south dakota like i've done comedy in south <laughs> yeah. dakota Holy it's a horrible shit. state what a fucking but i can imagine shit. the trailer courts there have to be like really shitty like the trailer courts are going to be like worse than trailer I don't courts know, dude. Else. My my grandma and grandpa live in a trailer court. My grandpa just died last, like a couple of years ago, but my grandma still lives in that trailer, and that trailer is pretty legit. Is it? Some of them are fucking trashy though, and yeah, like the one that I went to was definitely trashy. Although his shit was on a creek, so yeah. it was, it was kind of tight, you know. Like right. His backyard had like flowing water, you know. So he was probably. He's probably king of the fucking park, you know. Nice. Like if you're on the creek, you got the water, you like riverfront views, right? <laughs> like that's epic shit for a trailer, dude. So maybe not so much a creek, maybe just like a sewer drain. Maybe. <laughs> yeah. No, I, I, if I remember correctly, it was a legit creek. It's just a yeah. stream of hobo piss <laughs> just going down the road. Yeah, I, I mean, you know, whatever floats that boat, but. <laughs> Yeah, so I go out there, and and I thought this fucking guy was cool, man. You know why? Was because when I when I first like the first day I'm there, he he was he smoked cigarettes heavily, right? Right. Like, and and at the time I was you know smoking cigarettes too, so I was like, (laughs) all right, cool. So you know, he ended up fucking buying me like the first like within an hour of landing uh, a big camel tin. Which had like it was a big fucking tin like you would get with like popcorn, right? But like palm size, and it had it would come with like three packs of cigarettes in it, you know. And he got me Again, a fucking you're seventeen, right? Uh, yeah, 17, no, right? no, this was this was like sixteen, sixteen, dude, okay. and and so yeah, so he gets me these these camel cigarettes, and I just puffed heaters and drank beer for like the first time, you know, and like thought that Jeez. shit was amazing, you know. <laughs> And, and I think no matter what, like no matter no matter what the situation was, I still 
was just longing for a dad. Right. You know, like there that's all a kid wants, you know. So yeah, and and I spent that week out there and it was just fucking weird, dude. He like he was he was actually married, you know, which was really weird. He was married to this way younger chick who was like relatively decent looking tra- trailer park trash, you know, and it was like, yo, she was the queen of the trailer dude, park. Dude, like they were king and queen of the court. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> Straight up, like they were reliving high school years, you know, right? Like, yeah, and 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 so I spent that week out there and then I came back and I come back, and not more than probably like a month later, um, my dad calls me and he's like, I want a relationship with you, and and I was like, all right, cool, you know, that's all I've ever wanted, and he ends up moving, moving back to Minneapolis. And he, I guess he got rid of his trailer, you know, packed up his shit and he gets an apartment here and like actually does, he moves. And you know, like that, that was really cool for me. I thought that that was a a big step in the right direction for my life. You know, like all I had at that point was just partying and, and then still being young and longing for a father and wanting that type of relationship and not having it, having the anger issues from that, you know, still like at this time, like nobody, even my, my, I'd never mentioned to anybody yet in life, my first memory, you know, like the whole situation of how that shit went down and what it did and affected me. Like nobody knew that I actually knew that. And so I, you know, it like the, it was, it was just layers and layers of layers of early dysfunction that grew into the careless party animal that grew into the small money maker that grew into, you know, the hustle. So, right. like I said, I mean, I think it, it was just, it was one of those things that at the time, you know, like he moves back here and I thought that that was, like it was going to be like Brady Bond shit, you know, after with cigarettes that. and beer. Yeah. Well, <laughs> yeah. A lot, just get fucked up a lot more, you right. know, like not be so goddamn uptight, you know, <laughs> like Marcia, sweater. Marsha, yeah, Marsha. I'm I smoking my squares. Right. You know what I mean? Like right. that's my sweater vest. Right. Um, <laughs> Yeah. And so at that time, like he moves back and I'm still a little shit and I'm getting into all sorts of trouble and shit and I'm getting kicked out of schools. And you know what I mean? Like shit is going south for me really quick. And, um, and my mom has enough dude. And she kicks me out, you know? And, and so where else do I go? It, like it, I went to my dad and I started living with my dad. Right you know, for like the first time ever. Right. And this is like brand new relationship, super fucked up. And, and like, like we're drinking together, you right. know? God, that seems weird. Yeah. Like we, I, we, so we lived right up the street from, uh, this bar ground less of a dad, more of like a buddy. It's yeah. Well, like- for sure. Guaranteed. Like, dude, check this out. Like at the time we lived right up the street from this bar grandma's and, and I had a fake ID and we were going in there drinking, like whiskey together you right. know like and i'm in it this id that i use was just so bad like it was not it didn't even look like me but you know like i just some hustled. random black dude yeah <laughs> it, no i mean it wasn't that bad but it was <laughs> it was pretty fucking bad dude you know and <laughs> so yeah i mean it I, it, yeah, it is. It's a it's a friend. It was not a, a dad, you know. And I start living with this guy, and that became the spot. That became like the party. You know that spot. reminds me. I remember uh, in uh, "Don't Be a Menace to Society" while drinking your juice in the hood. Yeah, when he meets Massage. his dad. <laughs> uh, <laughs> when he meets his dad, his dad is younger than him. <laughs> yeah. And uh, he's like, you uh, have to... "Hey, son, you remember what I told you about uh, about about having sex and condoms?" He's like, "Yeah, not to wear them." That's right, son. <laughs> Yeah. Cause you can't feel that shit without condoms. <laughs> it's like the total wrong parenting message. Oh my god! It, yeah, <laughs> yeah, hundred percent. Yeah, that and that that just that sparked everything, man. And then like that became the the party spot. So like moving forward, we like we're all you know underage, super young, like in this house, just drinking, you know. Right. 
and it's accepted. You know, like other people are like, what? This is you where you live. You know what I mean? Like yeah. my parents fucking suck, you know, but in in the background though, like I don't even fucking know this guy, you know? And, um, yeah. And then the story so gets, is he, is he, I'm just trying to get a visual of him. He's mm-hmm. like, he's not mature, right? He's not clearly he's not, you know, I don't think he's all together in the mind. I mean, I, I so think, you think it was maybe a mental health I mean, I, I think or? I think there's definitely I know for a fact that there's mental health shit there just based on, you know, some of the stuff that he's done, you know, but right. I, I think, you know, who knows? I mean, I think I don't know, man, to to not be a father that takes a certain type of Do you ever say like, man. man, I probably shouldn't be doing this, but fuck it. Here's another beer. You know, there that never crossed his mind. I like mean, he but like, he, but here's the thing though, is I don't think he, he wasn't so much a, a drunk, you know what I mean? As he was just a fuck up. Like right. I was more the drunk, you know, he just like, would be like, all right, cool. You guys can, you know, we're smoking blunts in the house, fucking drinking, you know, beers and, and bottles and having parties and, you know, bringing girls back and, you know, like it was just, it was like living on your own at a young age, right. you know? And it was, it was just, it was super Did you and your dad up. ever tag team on a girl? No. <laughs> God, <I do. laughs> no, some, some, no, man. No. Some parents play catch with their kid. You, you know, well. I can share it's a fucking broad. I bet you that would be yeah. his ideal scenario of like father son bonding though. <laughs> right? You know what I mean? Like, I, I don't think, you know, like playing catch was his MO. I think it was like, yo. <laughs> Like let's snort some blow and tag team this broad, and right? life is gonna get way better for us, you know. Yeah, so I'm sure there's a Boy Scout badge for that. Fuck, tag dude. teaming a broad with your dad. I don't know, man. Yeah. There's some there's some crazy shit out there. I don't, I don't get too. I mean, you know, like I don't get into all that. that that's, <laughs> fuck, man. All right. so, no, yeah, I don't even know what goes on in that world. Well, we're getting close to time now. We're, like we're the big. Your first big hustle, and it's with your dad. Yeah, and that's so that's about, super fucked up. So how was, did that it, come about, dude? This was like the beginning. Whose idea was this? This was the beginning of the end, man. <laughs> uh, for real, um, it was definitely my idea, and and how this came about was at the time I I like just discovered, oh, not just discovered, but I discovered music early on. Mm-hmm. and like got a guitar for Christmas when I was young and learned how to play the guitar and shit. And it developed and my musical taste and influences developed over, you know, my party time and, and being young and adolescence and shit. And so then I got my first pair of turntables when I was like 13 ish, 13, 14 or something like that for Christmas. And I think like that's when some real nice ones, techniques. Yeah, I got nice. some. I got a couple of techs, dude, and nice. and it was like super legit. My mom sprawled out for Christmas one year and like really hooked it the fuck up. So I got like a really really good spread and and started fucking with records and vinyl and shit and discovering music or whatever, right? Uh, <laughs> but how this how this hustle came about is I was, you know, like the rap shit I was getting into really heavily and like through partying, we were freestyling at parties and like dubbing over tape cassette tapes and shit and making our own rhymes or whatever. And, and like, I really wanted to be in music. And so I remember telling my dad, like my dad was a, is a biker, believe it or not, which is super fucking funny. And it's, it's more of like a wannabe biker than a real fucking biker. I was going to ask, is he in a specific uh, yeah, gang? Or yeah. is he just... No, dude. He's, it, that's why I'm saying like, yeah. he, he, you know, he, he's one of those dudes that like fucking thinks he's a badass and drives a, a Harley, you know, or rides a Harley or whatever, but is just a fucking grade a loser, you know, like <laughs> not a not a biker at all not a tough guy um just anything if anything just functional like we said earlier you right know? um but yeah i made a joke to him one day and i'm like you know he was talking shit about my music of choice <laughs> which was like loud rap you know like right. fucking wu-tang and and just banging super hardcore rap and like west side connection and shit you know like <laughs> The shit that was just like super gangster and West Coast and you know whatever and and I made a joke with him one day and I'm like yeah you're not gonna hate this music when I when I make all this money and I'm gonna have this big ass platinum chain and and through just that very that very fucking statement like 
changed. It was like the butterfly effect, dude. Like it changed so many different directions, you know? Um, it, dude, it's crazy. So at the time he worked for this company that, that made catheters and, you know, the, the he, he was the plant manager. And so what? like, they, yeah, he was the plant manager. That's, that's the most surprising thing you've told me. So I know, <laughs> right? Like, like, like dude, right. That That's honest. Like, that's why, that's why I'm saying he wasn't like this crazy drunk or anything. Right. He was just more dysfunctional, fucked up, I think, in the head, like, and tried right. to portray it to not be that. Maybe. I don't know. Uh, but yeah, he, he he's a fucking plant manager, dude. So like for real king of the trailer park you know like he that's how he got that trailer on the river dude right. you know like he was the boss so he he's running this 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 plant that you know develops catheters and shit and the one they would test them or whatever and the ones that wouldn't work they would clip and all this excess waste would get swept up at the end of the night and like thrown away and shit you know but long story short as i make that statement to him and that that was like a ripple effect and he he was like, oh, as a joke, you know, like trying to be a prick, just the natural fucking him, I'm trying to be a dickhead. Like the next day brings me home this tiny little bag of like this scrap, you know, and he's like, here you go. Here's your here's your chain, you know, trying to be a dickhead. And it was like a little bit of scrap platinum. And I'm like, what is this? You know, and he tells me what it is. And then I'm like, what? And so I start like thinking about it and I'm like, how much of this can you get? You know? And at the time, cause at the time I'm like selling drugs and shit, you yeah. know? It's so my natural like, instinct. Like we were a bit is, of weight to it. How much yeah, did, you, did yeah. you bring back? Like, um, you know. At the first initial time, yeah. it, like, pfft. dude, it was, when I say like, you know, you know, like when you would get into like a, a dime sack, you know what I mean? Okay. Like a dime sack's worth, you know, it, it wasn't anything like super impressive, but it was more, it was just done as a joke, you know, but in my hustle mentality, mindset. I wonder what Platinum was trading at back then. 900 something dollars oh, you a know. Troy ounce. Yeah, at the time. Holy shit. Yeah, a Troy ounce, which was. Yeah, people sleep on platinum. They, they, oh, they fuck, dude. It was the highest platinum commodity. Platinum palladium, that's, dude, that's way the, more valuable yeah. than gold. Oh, dude, it was, it was the Most highest cases. commodity, like, out by far. You know, I think gold was, like, in the sevens. Right. But platinum was, like, nine, high nines, dude. Um, and, and so my first question to him is, like, what? Like, how, how much of this can you get? And. And he's like, I got unlimited like shit to this, you know, they just throw it away and I'm fucking flabbergasted. I'm like, you can, you have access to this. And I'm like, so I just tell him, I'm like, bring me a big fucking bag of this. Right. So I'm talking like the gallon Ziploc bag right. he brings home of just, and it's a lot, it's mostly plastic. Like, let's not get it fucked up. It right. is a lot of plastic, a little bit of platinum. But what I end up doing is going through and taking these super heavy duty, uh, like wire cutters and I end up cutting all the platinum tips off and the platinum tips are probably, I don't know, man, like, like maybe half the size of a Tic Tac, you know, it, they're, they're tiny. The right. tips of these, you know, the tips that are actually the platinum is that much, but it's fucking heavy. And a Troy ounce of this shit is probably about the size of a, if you took a pill, a pill bottle, it was a, a Troy ounce was about an eighth of that pill bottle. Okay. So if you, so, I mean, and do the math, a Troy ounce is trading at 900 high, a Troy ounce. I have fucking dude. Uh, we'll get to that. So, okay. so yeah, I take, I get this big gallon bag and I start cutting all this shit up and I'm trying to make it unrecognizable. Right. I don't know what the fuck I'm going to do with it. And, and I swear to God, this was like the dumbest, but most genius fucking thing that I ever did. Right. <laughs> Is me like being a, a young hustler and being an idiot. I start calling jewelry stores. So I, I remember like calling like fucking <laughs> like K jewelers, you know, in the mall and right. being like, Hey, I have this platinum. Would you want to buy it? And they're like, no, you fucking idiot. Like, we, <laughs> we sell diamond wedding rings, you know? Like, we right. don't buy gold. We <laughs> sell it. And I'm like, okay. So I hung up, and I called the next jewelry store. And right. they're like, no, we don't buy. We sell. And I and finally, I get a hold of one of these fucking stores, and they're like, I don't know. Try calling this shop downtown, which is like a high-end shop, right? So I was like, all right, cool. So then I follow the paper trail. I call this joint. And they're like, no, we don't do that. You're best going to like a refinery. 
and that's all I needed to hear, dude. I got my answer. So I kept pounding on those doors, and I fucking finally knocked one down. I got my answer. And I start looking up refineries, and I find one. And it's in Ann Arbor, Michigan, and I make the phone call. And, like, through a kind of, like, a little phone tag bullshit, I get in contact with this guy. And, essentially, I tell him this big fucking fabricated story and tell him that my grandpa just died and, like, I was going through his shit and there was a bunch of this scrap metal. And, you know, like, I didn't know what to do with it and was just seeing if they were interested in, you know, purchasing it or whatever. And the guy's like, yeah, you know, what it, what kind of shit is it, you know? And I'm like... It's, I really don't know. I just kind of played dumb, you know, and, and played, played that angle. But then, you know, for when I would take these things apart, I would take these pliers and just fucking do my best to mangle these things. So you couldn't identify what it was. Right. And, and yeah, so he's like, okay. And I'm kind of feeling this guy out a little bit and I'm young, dude. I'm fucking 17, dude. You know, like I'm young. And I'm on the phone with this grown ass man with like a good job, you know, makes buku bucks and shit. And I'm like hustling this guy and, and I think he's cool enough. So I finally break it out and I'm like, look, dude, um, what's what he, well, he breaks out the, how the, the things work, you know, you, you ship it in, they go through it, they weigh it out, whatever they'll, um, uh, you know, do all that shit and then they'll, they'll cut you a check and you got to be 18 obviously. Right. With a bank account and shit. And I, I don't know, not 18 yet, but my dad obviously is there. And so I end up telling this guy, like through feeling him out, you know, I'm like, look, he, he tells me that his commission splits and shit. And I'm like, look, I'll double your commission if you don't ask any questions. And that's all I said to him. And he said, done. And so I gambled. And what I did is I shipped him out. The first batch I shipped was really small because, A, I didn't know the value. Like, I didn't know what a troy ounce was at this time, right? right? Like, I just discovered fire. I have no fucking idea what did, flame did, I'm is. just curious. What, what was his commission, normal commission? What was double? Uh, he told me it was like 3%. So I, I doubled that up, you know. And But he's buying and trading big deals, you know. Right. So 3% is a big fucking so he's like a, like a broker kind yeah of. like okay. the refinery is like big fucking they're dealing in like volume you know okay. but they'll also buy shit you know whatever um but i just tell him i'm like dude i'll give you double if you just don't ask questions and he didn't hesitate and so it's my, good to know there's some those people in the world <laughs> that straight up don't ask so questions. many of them oh my god <laughs> money does a lot of shit it does to people do magic so i take um probably like a like a pop bottle, like a two liter bottle cap full. Mm-hmm. So if you take that cap off, you fill that up with tips and I send that off. Right. That's and, it. Just a cap. Full. Yep. Just that much. Just because, and I, at this time, and what does that weigh roughly? Oh, uh, well, so at the time I didn't know, okay. you know, um, at the time though, what I ended up having was probably like after all the work I put in on this, I had probably two to three full pill bottles of these platinum tips by now. Right. So, way more than this cap you know but i send this cap in and now keep in mind he he takes me to, through the, the legal shit like you gotta have a bank account right and i don't have a bank account at the time so i hit my dad up and i'm like look dude i'll split the shit with you you um just give me your bank account and and we'll we'll be partners in on this and he's like all right fine whatever you know neither of us at the time knew what was going to happen but um we send this pop bottle in or the cap, you know, the pop bottle cap in. I can't believe your dad is is, can, is the boss of this place and doesn't the thought never crossed his mind that he has access to all this valuable stuff. Dude, he's a f- fucking sheep, dude. Sheep oh, are dumb, shit. man. You know what I mean? Like he had no clue. And again, it takes the right mind to to put shit together. Like that's what the hustle is. You're either born with it or you're not. And his dumb ass was definitely not born with it. You know what I mean? Right. But. For me, like I put all this work together and and young, be, just by you know being naive, being young and dumb, right? And like, who the fuck calls jewelry stores and tries to you know ask you know what I mean? Like right. I discovered fire on accident, <laughs> and and I turned this around. And so I I long story short is the first check we get back off of this pop bottle amount, right? Is just over fifteen thousand dollars. Jesus Christ! Yeah. And I'm and so I get this check back and I'm fucking shocked and I'm like holy shit and it dawns upon me, 
that I have like unlimited supply of this. And currently in my possession, I've got probably like what, 20, 30 times more behind that one, you know, of those, you know, Holy caps. fuck. So, so I do, the money comes through. It's that shit legit. must be dense. I've never, I don't think I've ever held just raw platinum. It's fucking, it, dude, it's, it's crazy. Yeah. Holy fuck. You know what's funny? Uh, Blue uh-huh. actually tried to bite it. He thought it was bullshit and he took a bite of it and he chipped his front tooth on that shit. Should we fuck a story, dude? Holy shit. Yeah. Long story. But anyways, um, yeah. So, so at this time I'm 17, I cooked this shit up. We get this check and then like nothing comes from it and we're we're good like this dude's legit and so i i go gangbusters dude and i send out a full pill bottle and sure as shit dude a check comes in and it's over 50 grand and i'm like what the fuck dude so my dad gives me 20 grand so what about the the checks getting deposited are you what's going on with that i I have no idea no clue like here never came up no irs issues with i don't know it wasn't my account it was all going through my dad's shit so i i maybe i don't know i don't think he ever got busted but who the fuck knows dude i i don't know how you wouldn't i don't know right but i didn't give a fuck it wasn't my name you know like i and quite frankly this didn't last super long anyway so it wasn't like this went on for years you know what i mean this this whole thing this whole scheme probably went maybe like five months six okay. months you know at best so it wasn't like this long drawn out milking you know whatever um but yeah dude i send this pill bottle in and i get that over 50 grand back my dad gives me 20 grand and the fucking next day the first thing i do is i go out and i buy a motorcycle <laughs> of course you do i buy a fucking crotch rocket dude and i buy yeah like all my buddies were older, they all had bikes and were riding and stunt riding and shit. And and I was like, fuck yeah, I'm like let's go. So I went on Craigslist, went and found a bike for ten grand and paid cash, and that was it. I'd never had ridden a bike before. Showed up to this dude's house, and I think it was in like New Hope or something like that, Osseo. And I showed up to this dude's house. Don't know how to ride a bike. I've never ridden one before. Never popped a clutch. None of that shit. Give this dude 10 grand cash. He signs the title over and I attempt to ride this bike out of here, dude. Like dropping clutches and fucking, you know, just a disaster. Super funny. But yeah, and then, and that was it, you know, like it was on from there. Started sending them in, getting these checks, right? And, and I was young and dumb and still super into the party lifestyle and having fun and doing drugs and shit. So you're just blowing the money as soon as oh, you get it. Oh, fucking dude, that first 20 grand was gone, you know, like within a week. And it was on like Damn. a motorcycle, all the accessories. Who fucking knows what else was, you know, stupid purchases that were smaller that came out of that deal. But. Yeah, so we start doing that shit and hustling that out. And, we, you know, over the... Here's how it all came crashing down is, you know, over the amount of five to six months, I end up finding out how much money came in. And and I know how much I got. And we were partners on this 50-50, which right. was generous just because I cooked it up. And you know the chef always takes more. <laughs> but, you know, long story is I, I fucking, you know, this I find out this dude had, you know, over the course of that five to six month time frame, we had made just over $350,000. And I saw about... 40 45,000 of that. And and when I discovered that, I was pissed. And so my dad at this point, like my dad right at the point I discovered this hustle, you got to keep in mind like when my dad moved back, right? He wanted this to work out and He shit. wasn't smart enough to know to sell the platinum, but he was smart enough to fuck his kid out of the cut. Oh, of course, cuz you know, Jesus. yeah, that's what happens. But Holy shit. You know, here's the thing is so like when he first moved back though to back it up a little bit, like mm-hmm. he moved back with his wife and then they end up getting divorced and she takes 
everything, right? So this dude has nothing. And when I discovered this, like all of a sudden this uh, this two bedroom apartment they were living in is like fully furnished with these expensive antiques and <laughs> like shit where I was like, what, you know? And then all of a sudden he's got like a fucking fifty, sixty thousand dollar Harley, and I'm like, okay, you know, but I'm I'm dumb, I'm young, I'm fucked up right. all the time. I mean, literally, I'm just drinking and doing drugs all day, like every day, and then selling them. So right. you know, and now I've discovered um, I've discovered the hood, because this is how I this like is at the time frame that I start really getting the buying power get big time product and this kickstarted my career in drug dealing you right. know because it was funding it so so now the platinum thing are we is that done now that you guys had that falling well, out well and that was, so so this is the whole thing so up? so the whole the whole thing is like we're, we're doing this right but i'm saying at the same time i'm this is giving me all of this money to to fund other projects and shit so i'm so fucked up i don't even know what's going on with the money or, you know, and I'm not in control of the account. I don't see the account. So I had no clue at this time. Right. But anyways, the, the long story, how the shit wrapped up was I find this in like going through some of my dad's shit. Right. The, it was like this black box and he had all the fucking check stubs and shit in there, dude. And, and I was just blown away, dude. And so long story short is he comes home one night from the bar and it's just blasted. Like the night that I found out about all this shit and mm-hmm. he's blasted and, and I'm fucking pissed, dude. I'm with my buddy and, and long story is I confront him. He denies it. So drunk. I, we get into this fight and the, you know, like when you're, you're lifting weights, one of like the curl bars, you know, mm-hmm. he had one of those in his bedroom, like the shitty one you get from like fucking, you know, whatever sporting goods store and and he picked that fucking thing up drunk and he swung it and hit me in my ribs and busted my ribs out and and then i'd lost my shit and just started beating his ass dude and my buddy's trying to pull me off of him to make the story even worse is he's butt ass naked like true fucking story dude like he's so drunk he had stripped down his clothes to like who knows who knows what so when i busted in his room to like confront him you know after like building up like what i was gonna do He's butt ass naked, dude. So, yeah, dude. He he plows me with this thing, and my side blows up. We get into this fight, and then um, I leave the house before the cops come. And then, uh, I mean, the cops never came, but before somebody called the cops, so I thought, you know. And then, uh, long yeah, I I come back three days later after trying to cool out, and everything's gone. Like literally, everything is gone. Wow yeah i mean like shit was nuts dude and and that was it so then i went back with my mom and i he took off dude he changed his fucking phone number had no clue where he went you know like there was no way to to trail him and he took all the money so he ended up taking just over three hundred thousand, and and i fucked me out of you know close to a hundred and hundred fifty thousand dollars you know but yeah, so then he took off. But that was my first like real hustle, you know. And then I discovered I was good at this shit, you know. And then that developed into like messing with people in the hood because I had buying powers. So then I was picking up better shit, and then that led me to like, oh, I can afford cocaine now, and I can afford these expensive designer drugs. And then I was bringing that shit out to the hood, and then I got introduced that way. Like I was, you know, bringing better shit in for cheaper, and that was that. Um, so I get introduced to a couple of guys, um, that, you know, you know, big Rico was, was one of the guys that we ran with for a long while, but uh, I get introduced to his brothers in the hood. And, and that's what, about the time my life gets like crazy. Like if you didn't think it could get fucking crazier after all that stupid shit, that wasn't enough. Right. It like really took a turn for for the worse, I think, and and that's when things really got out of hand. Are we talking about this is before me and you met? Is this? this? Uh, yeah. I mean, it was it was roughly you know probably like a few years before me and you met, okay. and then that's when you know like I really started to get out of hand, and then me and you met obviously through like hood connections and shit, and 
it, yeah, I mean, I just, I went south really quick, you know, like there was no, all of that shit just, it was about money and, and it was easy and I got addicted to it, man. And you were doing you know, other hustles at this time. You're doing drug hustle. You were doing. Yeah. Coke, so, doing. so yeah, I, I started off with some weed and, and some, some Coke and, you know, cause I can afford Coke now. And, and that, then I discovered like for real fire, you know, because like, holy shit, I could make, you know, a couple hundred bucks selling weed. I could make a couple thousand dollars selling blow. Right. And I was like, holy shit, fuck weed, you know? So then it just, it was the lust for money. Then I start just exclusively dealing with what were you, coke. What amounts were you buying at the time? At the time I started off just buying like zips. So I'd, I'd buy like an ounce of, of blow. Yeah. And then I would end up breaking it up and like selling it in teeners, which was like, you know, just a, like over a gram or, you know, just we'd go to parties and sell it by the rail. Are you rail. selling to hood? I was going to say, are you selling the hood clientele? Or are you selling Dude, to at the time, at the, the time, burbs, I'm selling, selling to people in the burbs because that's like where really people could afford that shit. Mm-hmm. You know, like I didn't, I, I didn't know that like people could really afford that shit in the hood. But then I found out that people really wanted bulk of it, you know, through selling weed in the hood. Right. And then it was like, oh, okay, well, you know, and then through that avenue, you you start meeting people. And then, yeah, and then I ended up getting introduced to Big Rico, and we connect over music. He, you know, he was and still is like a, a rapper and whatever, and and at the time I was doing the DJ thing and, you know, was a big fan of music and that's the direction I wanted to head in my life, obviously legally and, and stay that way. And like, I thought I was going to be fucking rich and famous and like, you know, move to Hollywood and, and like have everything, you know? Um, and as a kid, that's, that's how silly you are. You're just, you're convinced that life is that simple. Oh, I still think that <laughs> any power, day now, more it's power all, to you, dude. It's you, all going to happen. Hold your, just, <laughs> hold your breath you know what i mean and it might it might happen right um so yeah and then me and you meet and and at that time you know i kind of started to to get out of um you know more try to focus more on what could happen musically just because i was really vested in the idea of how good the people were around me musically. And then not only that, I think, you know, I developed a really raw talent for words. We, we haven't been using dates. This is roughly 2002. Yeah. Roughly. Yeah. And so, yeah, I mean, yeah, I discovered that I can, I really have a way with words, so to speak. And I start, you know, like messing around with the music thing. And I started to really try to take that serious. Um, and get out of the hustle life, but th- that's hard to do. I mean, when you're pulling in money, and it's not like I was some crazy, like super powerful dope dealer. You know what I mean? Like I was just making really good money, and and just kept doubling up. You know, right. so it wasn't like I was. I just got a a, a crowd a GoFundMe campaign. You know, right. from from this other deal. You know, right. that I got fucked out of. But that small amount of money, I turned and I just flipped and kept flipping and flipping and flipping and. You know, you keep meeting different people and you keep taking that, sh- that. You know how that shit goes. That lifestyle will take you into places that you never thought you would ever see or you didn't even know existed. Um, now, now, it wasn't just the drug hustle you were doing either. You also had your your in and out business, too, briefly around this time. So, yeah. You know, do you want to explain I, what that is and how oh that man. worked? How that started? So when I was in... Start by telling what what an in and out is because... So, I, I know what it is, but I didn't know the reference. So yeah, so In and Out is essentially like a small prostitution ring. Um, you know, you you have a service like a back page ad, you know, or a Craigslist ad at the time, and you would essentially just you know discreetly sell pussy online <laughs> uh which was, this was really, back in, this is back in the wild west days of selling pussy uh, when, dude, just, just when the internet was starting to kick here, in here's the thing before man, it's, they it's were like, cracking down i'm a white wild. kid from the suburbs you know like i am not a pimp um and this is probably one of like the most trashiest things that i've done in my life and really regret you know i mean honestly it's it's really shitty uh but yeah i briefly had an opportunity to to run a, an in and out deal and I took I, I mean the the thing that I learned from 
a business mentor when I was young who was Russell Simmons. Not I didn't learn from him, but from reading his books and listening to him speak and shit like that was that you always like to be rich you needed at least seven different revenue streams coming in at all times. And so for me, I was trying to master the trades of like selling guns, fucking selling dope, you know, still selling weed in the burbs. You know, I had all these different hustles going on and, and I thought that that Why not was, add some pussy to uh, it? Yeah, yeah. yeah. And it just d- deep in my portfolio. Right. Um, <laughs> Diversify. Yeah, exactly. Right. You know, and, and that's the shitty part, man, is sometimes in life you're presented with shit. And, and, you, and again, you know, the hard part is I understand the environment that I was in it is it's a trap man and you know it, it doesn't it, it doesn't take you having to be from that environment to be trapped and the hard part is i trap myself in that shit but mm-hmm. um yeah i mean i get to the point where i'm really you know running multiple things and one of them was the the in and out and the other one was crack and and I want to go legit. So what I end up doing is getting a job at the strip club, <laughs> which you know because that's always the first step to legit businesses. Absolutely, dude. If you want to be club. legitimate and your your you know your legitimacy really matters to you, you join the strip club. Do, do you want to yeah. say the name of the strip club? Yeah. Oh yeah. Fuck. I don't care. Uh, I started off working for uh, Dream Girls. And I worked at Dream Girls for it's probably... such a deceiving name. I know. Holy <laughs> shit, dude. Just, nothing but nightmare oh bitches in there. Oh, my God. It's horrible, dude. It's just the, it's <laughs> the bottom of the barrel, dude, for sure. Oh, it's not... I mean, no. It's not BJ's. Come on Well, now. yeah, you're right. It's not holes, it's not holes with bullet holes. It's fucking, right, right. you know. But I, I was, you know... I was looking for a classier joint, but is it's this the white you know, Augies? Is what it, that one is. exactly? Yeah, and I used to remember we used to go to Augies and play poker. Oh man, remember that shit? Uh, sell ecstasy and oh, I mean, somebody I know that looked like me used to sell ecstasy and Augies. Yeah, sorry, officer. You know, um, and and so yeah, that was the thing. Is like at the time I did all that shit and it was super fucked up, and and then I want to go <laughs> legit. And and so I get this job at the strip club as a DJ, and well, and, and it wasn't that easy. Like, I had to audition to be a DJ. Right? Because it's very high standards when yeah. you're spinning records for hosts. Yeah, you gotta... dude. I mean, <laughs> I, I think I think the thing that I have is that voice. I have the right. specific yeah, good, good uh, radio yeah. rap voice. Yeah, yeah, I got the voice. And so that was the thing is I had to audition, and I and I saw this oddly enough, like on Craigslist when I was <laughs> looking through other shit. And and I see this like audition for Deja Vu and Dream Girls, and I was like, oh man, I could do that shit. I'm a DJ, and so I go downtown to to Deja Vu, and you literally go through the process of like waiting around in the room, and one by one going up to the microphone and like running the shit for a minute and talking and like introducing a girl. Is there? Is there I was gonna say, is there an actual stripper? There? Uh, no, there's there's no actual stripper present. What? Like it's it's they give you kind of like a script to read through, so to speak. You get a minute to kind of like get it down, and then you just you you, you use your own flair, like you okay. do whatever you do, you know. So I get up there and I just fucking kill it, dude. And there was there was like two hundred people at that first odd or at that edition that I was at. So like you're in a room and Deja Vu is big as fuck, dude. Right. And you're in this big ass room with all these other dudes. And it's just really awkward, you know. But long story is I, I fucking audition and like I think it was out of like five hundred people and I got picked. <laughs> and you know, like they're the winner. They do it, yeah. <laughs> it was it was crazy. I guess I had the, the winning finesse of voice, you know. And yeah, so I, I I start DJing at the strip club and planning my legitimate escape route of this like criminal lifestyle that I had become accustomed to. Now, now we, we skipped a couple things. I just want to backtrack on. Yeah. You start out with Coke. Yeah. You moved to crack. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. I sold crack early yeah. in my life, but I never cooked crack. Yeah. I bought it already cooked up, cut it up, sold it. Yeah. You cooked it yourself. Uh, not at first, yeah, and not not at first I didn't, but um, you know I hung out with the right with the right crowd, and you sell to the right people, and they'll show you some shit, and so yeah, through a couple of the people I was selling to over Northside, uh, 
I they taught me how to how to cook crack and now, uh, and I know basically kind of how it does. I know you know mm-hmm. in theory how how it's done. But what was your your recipe? What was the kind of the procedure? Um, you know, so you you got your Pyrex, you got all that shit. Like I'm not gonna go through the steps of like cooking crack, but right. I mean, uh, what? I mean, what'd you cut with? What'd you? Yeah, like I basically I wasn't taught to like cut anything, but it was like besides like baking soda and shit, you know. Mm-hmm. But like. You literally, there's this whole like scientific fucking deal, dude. And and the first like probably two or three times, I fucked up like thousands of dollars worth of blow trying to fucking like perfect this art. It's really? it's hard to See, do. That, that's something that would just scare me, dude. Death. It's it's hard. I'd like it's terrified. weird, you know. Like these guys are fucking like chemists, dude. Right. You know, like Breaking Bad hood style, because <laughs> uh, they know how to do this shit and they got the technique, you know. And long, you know, I didn't cook it for super long. Um, I just learned how to cook it. And then very, you know, minimally did I use that, that trade. Um, it really kind of came down to, I, I would just, I, I would do it in small batches and get rid of it to people that I knew wouldn't really give a fuck if it sucked. You know, right. so like I didn't have that pressure of like setting up, you know, like if you watch The Wire, you know, like it's I did not have this operation running with like crackheads coming to my window and like begging me because it was so good. Right. It was the fact of like when I did cook, it was just like a experimental deal. And I, I honestly got to the point where like, yes, I could do it. And I got to the point, too, where I was like, I'm fucking wasting so much money that I decided just to start buying it back in in rock already. Right. So. It wasn't that big of a deal, but yeah, for a brief period of time, like I learned how outsource to outsource that shit. Yeah, dude, outside. exactly. Yeah, it's always cheaper. I mean, it cost me fucking way less in mistakes, you know? Like, I'm not a, a chemist. I'm not, I don't have the patience for that shit, right. is what I learned. Um, so I just kept going back to rock. And then, you know, I really only took the crack route and like sold crack consistently heavily for probably about seven, eight months. Um, and then, yeah, a series of life events and, like, meeting people led me to some funny fucking stories. Um, so the, there was actually one story that's super fucked up is when remember when Katrina hit uh, mm-hmm. in New Orleans? I had kind of been selling this small apartment complex by my house. A couple of fucking crackheads lived in there. And I hung out with a dude that lived there and like, we would just smoke weed and shit, you know, but I met these fucking crackheads and you know, know, that's an opportunity. So I started like giving them shit and selling to them. And, and one of them is this, this black lady and it comes to be, you know, Katrina hits and then her son has to leave new Orleans and comes up here and starts to live with her. And this dude's name was Corey. And, um, this guy's like fucking six, eight, six, nine looks like a NBA player without the money, you know, like small twisty dreads, like fucking lanky, just for real looks like a ball player and he's into basketball. So like he looked the part, played the part. Um, but I'm selling his mom small amounts of crack and he's like aware of it. I meet this guy. We ended up becoming like friends and it's just fucked up. It's like, I don't know how you can allow anybody to sell your mom crack. Like I'd kill somebody, but yeah, like we would hang out and play basketball and shit. And so the funny story is like one night I get super ambitious and I want to go downtown. And at the time I think it was like club escape, which was like really popular down in block E. Yeah. And yeah, and we wanted to go to escape and like, and we also want to go to a strip club. And, you know, I was like, dude, I got an idea. So my, my bright ass gets this idea to, um, dress this dude up. Like I bring this dude to Marshall's, right. Or like TJ Maxx or whatever the fuck. Right. Like no bullshit. I get this dude a button up for like $13, like the flyest coolest looking button up you could get that would look like expensive but it's not it's tj maxx and and like i had him borrow his mom's like herringbone gold chain like 16 inch like choker almost on this dude and we got him some cheap fucking sunglasses like some aviator looking motherfuckers i know where you're going with this yeah dude (laughs) and uh 
And and I, I set him up with this whole outfit, right? The outfit probably cost me like forty bucks, you know. Right. And so this is an investment to me, right? Cost you forty, look like a million. Yeah, dude. And I'm like, dude, and I I did some like for real like top makeover shit, you know? <laughs> like I took like zero to hero, and and so my idea is to call the club and say that I'm an NBA agent and I represent this NBA player, Corey Dumar from the New Orleans Hornets. And we want to come out. To, he's in town and wants to go out to the club. And they're like, oh, absolutely. Right. Right. And, and so they buy it. And and so I'm, I'm like, <laughs> this is just slightly dude, before everybody was Googling everything. Yeah. <laughs> like, yeah. Straight up, dude. And, and I'm like, <laughs> and I'm like, I'm blown away that this is working but i roll with it you know holy shit. and i'm like so we'll be arriving you know and i play the real professional like i sound like an, an agent right? right making all of this shit up on the fly mind you you know and uh and, and so we test the theory dude and like four or five of us get in a car like some beat up shitty honda you know like <laughs> drive down like park in the fucking big like parking areas and shit you know and like hide the car and and we go and we walk to escape and they fucking like i walk in and i have him wait in like the side area by the elevators where nobody can see from the nightclub you know and and so I approach first and I'm like, hey, I'm here. I have Corey. He's going to be coming up. He's on his way up, you know, and they're like, oh, perfect. We're, we're ready for you, you know, blah, blah, blah. And and so I tell this dude, I'm like, and I'm like Midwestern. Right. Club and, right. right. <laughs> and I'm like, just so happy well, this, to have these, these are just anything people, close to a star dude, in the front door. Dude, these are just people <laughs> that like work at the nightclub. You know, right. they're just in charge of like bottle service. You know, their their job is to like, you know, Holy but yeah, shit. they they think that like an NBA player is coming through. Right? Is it Shaq? No, no, it's some other guy. I haven't heard of him. Yeah, dude. Yeah. <laughs> like super, super fucking good. And uh, <laughs> and and so I tell this guy to wait a couple of minutes and then come up with everyone else right and kind of like play the the entourage role like right. kind of a couple walk behind a couple walk in the side you know and <laughs> Corey, you be in the middle you know what i mean and i train this shit and and they do they walk up and they fucking walk us right back and they are super nice and what can we get you guys and they walk us through the <laughs> back door uh, way through the line and all that shit through the back door straight to the vip and they give us a fucking bottle and a vodka and we have like Grey Goose, you know, and it's on the house. And we're sitting in VIP of the club escape, which at the time was like the fucking oh, yeah. club, dude. Oh, yeah. Like that was the shit. I remember, huh? Yeah. Oh, people would go there to fucking stunt, you know, yeah. like, and here we are it all off of my dumb ass going to fucking now TJ Mayo, Maxx. Mayo Clinic physical yeah, therapy yeah, yeah. <laughs> yeah that, that one went blocky turned to shit yeah dude, it went south real quick but yeah i mean i i honest to god dude like called and convinced these dudes right and and we go and we get this free bottle and we get super fucked up in the club and people think that this dude is like they, nobody knows who he is but you, like if you're in <laughs> vip and you're fucking six foot nine like right. everyone's staring at you and they assume you're a ball player you know, so we're just getting crazy amounts of attention, you know, and it's just this dude is fucking nobody. You know what I mean? Like nobody. And yeah, it, it just it went down really slick. It worked. So the matter of fact, the bar's closing and I'm like, hey, that's I'm going to one up myself on this. And I called choice um, or not. Cho not choice. Uh What's the the real strip club that's downtown? Not Rick's, but it was down by Rick's. Oh, the Seville? No. Oh, you're talking about um the one that, it's in the old bank building. Yeah. I can't ever think of the name of that one. Neither can I. Shit, it was a nice one until the Seville opened. It's like yeah. Seville. Yeah, and it was like plastic. at the time it was like the top end, highest end strip yeah. club. It was still a nice one. Yeah, apparently. but either way, I pulled the same fucking gig and I called the strip club and I'm like, <laughs> same shit. I'm the agent and we're coming through. And same fucking thing, dude, is is they bring us in, and it's not like super crazy treatment or anything, but they bring us in, set us up with a bottle of champagne, which was cool, and right. and we drank some champagne and literally got no dances because we were broke as fuck, dude. Like, at that time, like, nobody had the money to be fucking with strippers, you know? Like, 
or I guess maybe wanted to. Right. And, and like, yeah, like I, I put 40 bucks on this dude and we turned it into a free night of bottle service downtown at multiple clubs. It was, <laughs> yeah. The hustle, man. Yeah, I was going to say, that's, that's amazing hustle right there. That's, that's yeah, the, it's just out of the box. Hustling. You know, what's funny is like my mom said this to me one time and it really kind of fucking stuck with me. And I don't know if it's a good thing, but she, I remember her telling me, she's like, you know what? You're an opportunist. And I was like, what the fuck does that mean? And then I thought about it and she's like, well, she's like, it doesn't matter what the opportunity is, whether it's good, bad, you'll die from it, go to jail or save with somebody. Like if you're going to weigh that, you're always going to weigh the options. And, and I'm like, fuck yeah. You know, like that's what I feel like a real, you know, a true entrepreneur, hustler, businessman, you know, whatever would do. Right. You, you did, uh, some other, uh, activities around the same time that were a little bit more aggressive than just hustling. Mm-hmm. You had a couple, you had a couple of robbery, uh, <laughs> yeah. Esque, robbery you know, when, enterprises. When, <laughs> One so, strangely enough, right around the corner from where I live now, but holy shit. Yeah. Weird. You know, so <laughs> and yeah, that's a trip down memory Small lane world for real. Um, yeah. So, you know, this, that's the hood life and you're around these people and you're used to violence and you're used to, uh, being overly vocal, aggressive, you know, whatever. And, and through that you develop this hustle and you develop this mind for business. And then you develop a, a thing that I call fuck it. Like you just straight up don't care. Like you don't know if you're going to live tomorrow. And so you're like, fuck it. I'm going to do whatever, you know? Um, and, and so at the time, like one of my revenue streams was to be robbing drug dealers because to me, that was the perfect fucking robbery. Like what did they, they can't do anything. They can't call the police on you. And quite frankly, like I had developed a name by just being into fights and, and not really get being on the fuck it, you know, right, right. and, and very few people live on fuck it. Right. You know what I mean? Like it's a small planet. Most people don't want to fuck with fuck it either. No, like, no, oh, dude. Fuck they it. know what I'm fuck not it fucking brings. with fuck it. Right? Fuck yeah, it is. yeah. Like fuck it is gonna really fuck me up. You right. know, like, and so that's that's how that shit went. And then, um, yeah, the, the fuck it really developed into like you know just where can I get money? How can I get money? Fuck it, I'm gonna get money. You know, and that was like the the hood mentality, if you will. It was just like, I don't give a fuck what I'm going to do. Like I, I'll do whatever, you know, like I'm just going to get it. And then you watch like gangster movies and shit and you kind of idolize some of these guys. And like when you grow up with this shitty upbringing and no good influences and no, those are your influences. Yeah. Like that's, that's what, you, what you gravitate towards and think is a reality. Like you're young, like young people are impressionable, man. It's crazy. And I didn't, you don't ever see that shit when you're young. And then you grow up and you get older and then you revisit your, your shit. And, you know, like when we were just kind of talking earlier about stuff, you know, from like, we haven't seen each other for fucking like 10 plus years or something, you know, and, and you're kind of going down the, the memory lane and you're like, holy shit, man, like life is really crazy. And one of those things that I chose to do, uh, yeah, was, was rob drug dealers. And one of, one of the instances happened to be right by your, your house. And yeah, so, so there's, there's a police station really close, very close, very close. And, um, you know, this particular place, like it, it, it is maybe four, five blocks from the police station. Yeah. Um, and it was my birthday yeah, I think it was my 22nd birthday. Big we, apartment building, right? Big apartment building, yeah. And 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 it was my 22nd birthday. And, um, you know, a few weeks before I'd met this dude, this young buck that was kind of like my age or a few years younger who was selling weed and, like, thought he was big time and had a couple of pounds. And, and you know, like, we, we played dumb and we were like, oh, because like, us, we saw that's an opportunity or what we would call a mark, you know? And we were like, oh, perfect. And so we we start plotting on this kid, you know, or I start plotting on this kid and then I bring in my guy who I used to do all this shit with. And then, uh, and you, and you don't just do it. Right. You, you kind of set him up. You, 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 yeah. So I go and buy like weed from him for the first couple of weeks. You friend know? him and yeah. And, and, and smoke with him and like, and... yeah. And just all oh, cool. I just lost my connect, whatever type shit, you right. know? And then I end up meeting him. Um, I met him at the bar and then, 
So through that, like, you know, we start, he starts bringing me to his house. We're smoking. And this goes on for a couple of weeks or whatever. And then finally I'm like, okay, I find out when he's like, he says he's re-upping and then I'm like, okay, perfect. So fast forward now, a couple of weeks later is my birthday. We're out, we go out, we get super fucked up. Right. So we're all just trashed. Judgment is the least of our concerns at this right. point. And I decide like, fuck it came back like he, he came back and he visited that night and it was like fuck it you know like i don't care 22 or not like i you know let's ride and so we go out to this place and it's probably like close to 2 30 in the morning a.m uh and this place is literally like four or five blocks away from the police station and it's a very big large you know apartment complex and this dude lives on the first floor and I hop the balcony, you know, that's like little four feet balcony or whatever. And, uh, this takes me a minute. I, this, this is what was crazy to me is it didn't, I I'm trying to kick in the, the sliding glass door and I boot it like hard and it doesn't break the first time. <laughs> right. But it is loud as fuck. Right. Right. And, and now I also brought a pistol cause I didn't know if dude was home or not. And so like, I thought I was going to be able to kick this motherfucking door and it was just going to shatter like a movie, you know? <laughs> and I was going to like bum rush that shit and like, you know, like just take over. It, well, it just didn't play like that. I hit this fucking window and it's just a loud, loud thud. And so I, and I, I kicked it from facing the, you know, like tried to like fucking ninja kick it, you know? All right. And so now I'm like, oh, shit, you know, and I do a quick panic and I turn around and I grab the railing, uh, the balcony railing. And from like a donkey kick, the fucking shit out of this glass door and it shatters. And me and, and the other guy, we, we run in and within two minutes, like dude ends up not being home. But within two minutes, we ransack this fucking one bedroom apartment and yeah, and I find this stash, and there was five pounds of weed and a bunch of cash, and I stuffed that shit under my my Echo hoodie at the time. <laughs> I just remember that hoodie because it was big as fuck, you know, and it all fit under my shirt, and we ran out this dude's front door where we had the car waiting because his apartment was super close to the front entry, right. and we ran right out the front door and hopped in this getaway car and sped off and went back to my house and divvied all this shit up. So what was the score? Uh, it was like five pounds of weed. And I want to say it, it was, it was probably upwards of like $20,000 cash. It was, it was really crazy. And I didn't even think dude was like pushing like that. All right. I think it was like 15, 20,000, uh, cash. And then, like I said, like the five pounds of weed and we just started divvying that up and we were just smoking and shit. We didn't care. You know, it was all, we had money from doing all that other shit, but it was just another hustle. Um, yeah that that was probably the most one of the most if not the ballsiest one just being so fucking close to the cops and right yeah that's, that's like crazy close dude and that. then trying to <laughs> kick open a fucking like drunk kick open a sliding glass door i mean fyi it's just not as yeah. easy as you would think <laughs> like that glass. never like the movies dude never that glass is thick as fuck like grab a rock or something like a big boulder you're right. better off yeah come prepared now the the other one that you wanted to tell is one that I don't know. I knew that when you told me that one already. Yeah. But what about the 9 a.m. story? Dude. So this is kind of fucked up, right? Like there was this. All kind of fucked up. <laughs> well, I, I, overall, I, yeah, you're right. Yeah, totally. Fair. Uh, so I, I'm sorry to my mom. Like my mom knows this story, so it's not like this is anything new to her, but it's still super fucked up of me to do to her or involve her in this somehow. Uh, but yeah, I knew this kid, uh, from the suburbs and, and he lived kind of out by the airport in, in a city that, that I'm out living in now, actually funny. It's actually funny cause I bought a house right up the street from where this occurred too. So like, that's odd that we both live in places extremely close to the right. crime scene. Uh, but this kid was kind of, you know, like nerdy and, and not really, you know, not a tough dude, but like he was pushing a lot of weed. And so long story short is like my mom used to do a lot of insurance shit and she would have to travel a ton. Mm -hmm. And so here's what was super fucking crazy about this is my mom was super anal about her vehicles. Like growing up, I was never allowed to drive any of her shit right like ever 
And so finally, one time she allows me to drive her car and it's to drive her to the airport. Right. And and I'm like, OK, cool. And, and I know that <laughs> this dude lives over there and I know that there is this uh, like shit there. And and I know dude's not home. And I know that anybody in that area doesn't know this car. So I take my opportunity. I drop my mom off at the airport like eight fucking in the morning whatever you know and i drive immediately from the airport and this house is probably like 10 minutes from the airport and i drive over here dude and it's in the morning fucking broad daylight like birds are chirping and shit sun is shining right like a couple hours before the fucking mailman is out like delivering his route you know and I'm knocking on this dude's side glad like he this dude has a front door and a side door like which is odd but these houses are super close to each other too you know but the side door off to the side um I go over there and I'm tapping on it with you know a screwdriver on the door like a big knock and nobody answers and shit and so and it has those little uh you know probably like 6 by 6 glass panels you know, that right. are kind of like on the top half of the door or whatever. And so I kind of, I'm knocking, I'm kind of looking around the neighbor's house. I could damn near like reach out and touch, but I take the fucking screwdriver and I bust that corner panel out of this dude's window and I open up the door and I go inside and I'm by myself and th- this house is empty. Like dudes at work are already <laughs> like, you know, thank God, I guess. And <laughs> and so I walk in, and it's like I'm going through this computer room, and I find, like, a shitty shotgun, you know? Like, it, it was kind of, like, hidden, but not in, a, like, a gangster way. It was just, like, it was in a fucking case or whatever, you know? And I was like, oh, damn, you know, like, I'm already finding shit. And then I knew, because I've been to this dude's house multiple times, dude, like, lots and it wasn't like a buddy. It was just somebody that I'd plug from every now and again, right. you know? Um, but I went downstairs where the last time, like I was and saw shit, you know, and I ended up finding the stash of like, uh, Mason jars of, of weed. And then, you know, I'm like, there's, there's gotta be more. Like I knew this dude really had a good clientele base. Right. And cause we knew tons of the same people. Uh, from being out here in the suburbs, you know, and, and yeah, so I go upstairs to this bedroom, but it's like a fucking loft, you know, with like the, you know, the V ceilings and the whole nine, it's super cramped and, and whatever. And it's like so old that the fucking drawers are like built into the walls, you know, like that shit. And so I'm looking through all this stuff and I'm trying to go as quick as I can. I'm not coming up with anything. And I swear to God, dude, like my mind just works for this type of shit because I'm thinking and I start going through all the drawers and I'm looking under the clothes and shit and feeling around and nothing's there. And I, I'm, I, I don't know what told me to do this. Like I really don't, but I end up pulling out the bottom drawer because I'm thinking about where would I find a stash spot if this was my house right. as I'm doing this. So I pull out the bottom drawer and I see that there's, it, there's like space underneath. It's like the floorboards and shit, you know? Right. And so there's nothing visible there, but I reach my fucking hand down and I'm like, oh, this is deep. This is like a deep cavity. And I fucking curl my hand back there and sure as shit, I feel it, dude. A bunch and of mason jars? No, a fucking stacks of cash, dude. I find a rip of cash. And and I fucking, and it's like, and immediately I'm like, oh my God. Like, you know, and I do this shit in like record time. And I'm right. not like condoning it, you know, applauding it, any of that shit. I don't want to make it sound cool. At the time, it was like, wow. Yeah, kids, don't rob drug dealers. Yeah, kids. no, I mean, none yeah. of this shit, I'm, I'm not telling any of this shit to, like, boost an ego or, like... But if you it, do, check cool. the drawers, kids. Yeah, but, like, look for stash bots. <laughs> I mean, I'm I'm just telling this because like the reality is I've done a lot of shit, but I've I've definitely changed my ways. Uh, but yeah, that was 9 a.m. I I grabbed the cash and I fucking dipped out. I hopped in my mom's car and listened to KDWB because I didn't want to change the presets, <laughs> and and was just like super stoked. And by like 10 o'clock, I was drinking like a fucking coffee and and laughing. So what was the score on this one? 
I don't honestly specifically remember, but it was it was it was pretty healthy, dude. It was probably upwards of like the ten fifteen thousand dollars for sure. I mean, it was it was a large amount. It wasn't like the largest score I'd ever hit. I think the largest score I'd ever hit came close to probably like in total value over a hundred grand. But that's a story that I I'm not gonna. Oh, that's one you can't tell. Yeah, that's the one I can't tell. Can't but tell. Yeah, that'll I'm, come out in the book. Yeah, maybe. Uh, but yeah, I mean, and and so, so through all that shit, you know, and then, um, I've, I've developed a knack for, for turning a dollar into 10 and 10 into 20 and 20 into a hundred, you know, and and that's kind of, I took that fuck it mentality and I took the shit that I learned from being in the hood and I took the shit that, you know, I had, had been looking for my whole life and, and really went and did it, you know? Well, sometimes your your ability to hustle got you in trouble because you were so good at it, right? Yeah. What about the uh, the JoJo story? Yeah. So when I was in the hood, like I was, I obviously came through with better product than anybody had out there, and I was not charging ridiculous amounts either. I was being smart about it, and so I built up a really good. Um, following if you will (laughs) and and, you know so i was yeah and and what was funny about it is like i was the only white dude that was out on the block and this was at cottage park so if anybody's familiar back in the day this was where spurs gas station used to be like right across the street from spurs and that's where all the shit went down so it's broadway and penn right and Cottage Park is just right behind that, and that was that was our stomping grounds. Uh, Since I've lived in, in the Twin Cities, I've seen more within a ten block radius of that area than yeah. I've seen. Dude, I mean that, that's equivalent to like a fucking war zone, dude. Yeah. And and at that time, that was like the murder spot. That was the gas station where people were getting fucking murdered. Back when they were calling it Murder Murderapolis. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And that was like the really that was the hottest spot like you could find. Yeah. Period. Between there um, and Twenty Sixth Street, that, that, yeah. that was kind of like the the danger zone. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And it, it was bad too, dude. And like, what made me think that I belonged there was fucking stupid. Right. But you know, and I should be dead ten times over. Um, and, and you know, like that was the thing is being out in Cottage Park, and then um, <laughs> you know, I I developed this fan base because again, my product was better and it was cheaper. That's just fucking bit common sense. Right. You know, I mean doesn't take a rocket scientist to know you got better product for cheaper fucking dough. You're going to get more co- more clientele. Um, and so there was this dude on the block that used to push with the, with everybody, and his name is JoJo. And, and dude was super fucking salty that the white dude was out there. But JoJo was salty? Yeah. <laughs> right? Yeah, this As fucking... Dude, this French fry motherfucker, dude. <laughs> this big potato-looking motherfucker, dude. Yeah, he he was mad that I was out there, a white kid making lots of money, and outselling him. Um, and it, you know, although it wasn't direct competition, um, you know, we all kind of pushed on that block or two. It was, you know, talk about your cultural appropriation, man. Like, that's yeah, terrible. yeah, dude. And so, Selling so everything. yeah. And so one day Jojo had enough though. That potato motherfucker pulled a gun out and sticks it in my face and I'm backed up with my back against a car and it's like a fucking 1995 Geo Prism and it's small as fuck and it's bright red. You're the most embarrassing car to get murdered Straight on up, Geo dude. And Give me on a Cadillac. Give me something with some class. Well, you know what's fucked up? Is like Give me on a Geo. Dude, this is the first time I have a fucking gun pointed at me you know and like this i legitimately it crosses my mind i'm like i'm gonna fucking die dude like this is it but it happens so quick you know yeah. so anyways this he pulls his gun out on me he's got my back against his car i'm fucking he's talking all this crazy shit to me i'm not saying shit and um it, one of one of the buddies, like one of the homies, fucking pulled out a forty five and started shooting into the air and <laughs> got got a little wild west with it and fucking ran out of bullets. So like, <laughs> if shit went down, I was fucked, you know. And and another homie, rest in peace, my guy Jada, uh, ran up to the abandoned church at Cottage Park right there where where everything was hidden and out of the bushes. We had the AK forty seven hidden. 
and sure. he did. I didn't. I mean, it's not like uh, it wasn't mine. Right. Uh, this is their stash spot for their business. <laughs> yeah. And clarify here, dude. I'm not as badass as the this community. Shit sounds. Yeah. yeah. It was, uh... I was just there to make money and shit and like an opportunist. Like my mom. It wasn't said. like a nice bike. It wasn't no. like it was, anybody could use it. <laughs> right. Yeah. It was just. It was a neighborhood utensil. You know. It's like barring sugar, dude. It's... <laughs> Uh, and so he ran up there while, while my other buddy is, you know, shooting off in the air, trying to scare people. And he comes out and, and after, after dude runs out of bullets, like I think fucking potato face knows what's <laughs> up. And he's like, think it must've crossed his mind. Like, Oh, he's out. And by this time when, when he starts shooting into the air, I like, <laughs> you know, like, Cause it takes Jojo's attention off of me. So I like dip around the front of the car and like duck down, you know, and I'm like trying to hide and shit. And, uh, yeah. And then after numb nuts runs out of fucking ammunition, uh, Jojo starts fucking looking for me and sees me hiding, ducking in, in the front of the car. And he starts reaching over the fucking car, trying to shoot at me. And, uh, and yeah, and I'm, I'm I'm essentially dodging bullets. And then Jada came out right then and started just completely lighting up the whole entire block with this AK-47. And everybody dispersed. Like, that's the sign. You know, like a couple of gunshots is one thing, you know, like when you're like getting like a 30 round banana clip of bullets. Nobody's <laughs> fucking with an AK, dude. You know, they know what's going to happen there. So that cleared everybody out. And literally, I'm convinced to this day that that saved my life, dude. Uh, I mean, who knows what could have happened in that situation. But, you know, I mean, if, if it wasn't for Jada, who fucking knows, dude? And right. And sadly enough, dude, um, I mean, you knew Jada as well, but like Jada was, was also murdered three, three years ago now, four years ago now. Right. Um, and he had, he had done kind of the same shit I did. Like he was working on turning his life around and he had kids and, you know, like really was, was a good dude at heart, but he was also known as the, the shooter and, and in the, in that environment, you, you know, that's, you live by that shit, you die by that shit, you know, and, and that's how it goes. Uh, so I think, you know, for me to even be here is, is beyond wild and crazy. And then playing back all these stories and shit, you, I think you start to kind of realize like how much you escape death. And, and, you know, um, at that point, you know, I thought this shit was really getting serious and, and I was really out of hand and, you know, um, and then it, and, and then I was at 26 and, and I've, I have a kid, you know? Well, well, there's a story before that though, right? The, where you got pulled over. This is kind of like the, like, oh, your, this, is yes, like yes, this is like, yes, yes. What made yeah. you stop right before Yeah. That. So my awakening moment, like my fucking wake up call to Jesus, if you will, was, um, I, I still was like pushing multiple drugs and at the time i had a bunch of crack and i was going to um i was going to drop off an ounce of cocaine and i had it broken up into eight balls and um it was stashed in my dash but it was not a hard find by any stretch of the imagination you know like a trained officer would find that in a fucking heartbeat um, and then in the trunk, I had a loaded nine millimeter pistol with hollow points and an extra clip back there that was also fully loaded with hollow points. And then like three boxes of extra hollow points. Um, and then like, you know, just in case. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yeah, dude. And then like a couple of grand cash. Right. Um, and so picture this, right. Uh, my family's like my aunt's in town and I'm supposed to go. And this is like a Sunday, dude. I'm supposed to go like to a brunch and like meet with my aunt who's just in town for a few days. Gotta go to brunch after this cocaine deal. Well, here's the thing. It's like, <laughs> I know it's so fucking trashy, right? Like it's not as glorious as the hood shit. It's just fucking like we went to Denny's, you know, or right. whatever. Um, that makes it even trash. <laughs> no, that's not true. I didn't go to Denny's. That was probably like green. No. Okay. There you go. <laughs> it, was, it was a little more classy. Uh, but yeah, so I'm on my way to do this, and I actually get pulled over, dude. And what I get pulled over for is having an expired license, uh, or or uh, revoked license. I didn't, and I didn't know this at the time, and you know, I didn't really, I wasn't really receptive to mail, <laughs> <laughs> you know. 
Like, I didn't really, like, like this was before, like, email. Too busy being a drug kingpin hey, to you know check your mail. <laughs> really. Dude, I, yeah, you know, like, that just was not on my to-do list for the day. Right. You know, it was fucking sue me. And so that I didn't check my mail, sale. you know, and apparently they sent out a letter and revoked my shit for unpaid tickets somewhere along the oh, line. Oh, Jesus. Yeah. And so I'm I'm driving without you know a license apparently and I don't know this. You're and riding the dirtiest, the of, dirtiest of the dirty, yeah. unknowingly. You, you, know, like, you could only be dirtier as if you had like a dead body in the trunk, <laughs> perched up front in the seat, like <laughs> right? glasses on, and like you know, no, this is just a Halloween mask. You know, like, I don't know how he got there, officer. Yeah, I don't even know this person. Uh, <laughs> It's just fuck yeah, dude. That's about as bad as it can get, right, right. there. Yeah, and uh, <laughs> <laughs> uh, it, it's it's really yeah, it's it's really shitty. Um, I get pulled over, and I in my mind am fucking panicked beyond panicked beyond any feeling of even understanding or comprehending the word panic. And on the surface, I play it as fucking calm as I do when I was in court every other week. <laughs> it was just another day, and mm-hmm. I was just here smiling. And um, <laughs> well, hello, officer. Yeah. <laughs> so so he pulls me over, and he's like, "You know why I pulled you over?" And of course, I'm like, "No, I don't." And he's like, "Well, you have an expired license." And you know, I'm like, "The fuck I do?" No, I don't. You know, like, well, we've sent out mail. You know, and I'm like, "No, you didn't." And of course, in my head, I'm like, you don't "Fucking check the mail, dickhead." <laughs> you know, like, "Fucking a, you could have avoided this one." Uh, but it it you know it turns out he um they want to search the car. And the reason, yeah, I mean, again, because here's the thing in this particular city, which which uh, we're actually in right now. Right. And, and I'm, I'm very was at one point in time, very recognized by every <laughs> article of fucking police uh, people in this in this vicinity. Uh, they 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 knew what was up and like they, they kind of were looking for like a freebie out of this deal, I think. Uh, but they, they snatched me over and they want to search me. And, and I can't say anything. So they actually pull me out because, you know, I'm driving illegally and they put me in handcuffs and they place me in the back of the squad car. Right. Now this is before the search starts and shit. And, and I am fucking like in my head, you're sitting in the back of a squad car and you're handcuffed and you are literally watching in front, you know, fucking 20 feet in front of you, 15, 20 feet in front of you. Officer is about to start going through your car, knowing that you have all of these items and belongings in this vehicle right. that will send you to jail definitely, like not questionably, like for a prison. long time. Like not jail, yeah. prison. Yeah, dude. Yeah, this first offense or not, it doesn't matter, right. dude. Um, you've got like three or four first offenses. In, in your holy car. shit! And not only that, an ounce of right. crack. Broken up into into fucking eight balls, man. Like that is intent to distribute it's for like personal a use? motherfucker. Yeah. <laughs> so like it was just a hand me, like a golden plat that is what like cops salivate over. At this point, like, all you have at this point is that you're white. That's, that, that's dude, all you have. And at going the time, like I was still pretty hood. <laughs> you know? right? So like I didn't you're really like half white. I right. I was like still kinda looked at like I was like black though, you know? Like you know, I was like the the white kid that wanted right. to be black, you know, from their perspective. So it was like, okay. Fuck this kid. You're just hoping a black guy starts selling a cigarette somewhere close by. Yeah. So the cops I'm like, oh, lose it. <laughs> oh, man. So the cops find something better oh, to do. Oh, yeah. Ouch. That's, yeah, I, <laughs> I, I'm going to stay off of that one. Uh, <laughs> so, yeah. I uh, it, the, the, So the, the cop is asking me, obviously, do you have anything? You know, and of course, I'm like, no, whatever. And. And they're like, can we search? And I'm like, you know, if if you need to, you know, and I'm just trying to play it cool. And long story short is the cop radios in. And this is like what made me sweat is it took like five fucking minutes or more of radio silence of like watching this cop stand out there. And then like I hear from, you know, the, the vehicle like has a soft radio playing. 
you know, like, and I'm cuffed and it's not like setting the mood, but I see <laughs> another fucking SUV squad roll up and it says K9 on the door, dude. That's never good. And I just a fucking canine, dude. And I swear to you, man, I, I am, I am Buddhist first and foremost. Uh, and, and I, I'm not like some crazy monk, but and if you're religious, fine, whatever, that's cool. But, uh, you know, what was super fucked up about this is like this was the first time I ever actually prayed. Right. So like I discovered God in this moment. You Usually know? when it happens. Yeah. <laughs> it, of course. It's always in the time of need, right? right? Like what do you do for me lately? Um, so I'm I'm talking to God, if you will, for the first time in the back seat of this fucking squad car, cuffed, sweating my balls off, and about to have a fucking heart attack. And I remember closing my eyes and gently lifting my head up till to the sky and saying to myself in my head if you let me out of this i will never touch cocaine ever again in my life and i bet that prayer that same prayer gets said a lot by a lot of people <laughs> oh my god <laughs> fucking in recovery every day dude you know like these, these sad sacks can't get away from it uh right. And yeah, so I, I pray for the first time, and then this canine shows up, right? And then I, I swear, dude, this is this is a miracle. I mean, I truly think this is one of like the most divine interventions that have ever. A happened lightning in my bolt life. comes down and strikes <laughs> the dog. Dude, that, I, that would be even more. That would like to be. Uh, that's about the only thing that could make this more epic, dude. Straight up. Um, but no, actually. The fucking neighbor, old the over the old neighbor ladies, right? That are like buddy buddy and like go speed walk together in the mall at like six a.m. You know, they end up choosing the fucking primest time to go walk their dogs, who happen to be little fucking shits, oh, and nice. are barking at a fucking storm, dude. And for whatever reason, they don't end up bringing the dog out. And I'm watching them search the car. Now, I also want to say I'm not a complete fucking idiot. I did hide the crack in the dashboard, and I also hid the pistol and everything else, like, right. really well. So it's not like, you know, you were going to – except for the – You didn't hide it in a box marked pistol, did you? No. <laughs> but you know, you know what I did have, though? I did leave the, box, the couple of boxes of hollow points out. That was the only thing that was actually, like – not illegal gonna be able to be found right right um and so i'm watching the, the two cops kind of go through this shit one of them ends up leaving the search of my vehicle to go back to the fucking canine and like calm his fucking ass <laughs> you know this dude is just out for blood and uh i watch the other now it, the the where i had it hidden there was like this little tray i was driving a fucking mazda millennia at the time and it was like super fucking dope and like had 20 inch rims and a tv in the dash and the whole I nine just, yeah just super fucking stupid right smoked a lot of weed in that car. yeah uh, it was just dumb and <laughs> and it, on the side right like next to the the steering wheel on the left hand side there was this small little button and if you just press the left it was like a little lever button and if you pressed it down a small little tray would pop out that was about the size that you could fit like two packs of cigarettes in it Right. And that's where my stash was. So all you had to do was hit this button. So when I say hidden in the dash, that's a really loose right. fucking description of how well it was hidden, though. You know what I mean? Like, it was just a button away. And I am watching this officer on his knees out my door. And he's there for, like, what fucking, to me, feels like hours but probably like three, four minutes straight, you know, and that's the money that that is what, the, he, what he's doing. He's looking in the in the really hard to get spots is what he's yeah. probably doing. He's, yeah. he's not. He's like, no way is he going to hide it in this. I don't clearly know. Clearly easy, obvious. Dude, I mean, I don't you have to be familiar with the car, though, because it's not right. one of those things. that's like super, super visible. The button right. anyways, it blends in really well. So it's like unless you knew. Cops just I think, love to look underneath that dash. Right. They always think you're going to put something. Oh, yeah. never put anything underneath Yeah. That. And so, but here's the point in, in time where I'm like, I'm fucked. That's it. Like, here it is. That's it. You right. know? Like, there's no way you can be right there and not find this. Like, it's literally fucking staring you in the face. And four minutes go by, maybe, and dude comes up. Worst and, cop ever. 
and empty handed, dude. And I'm like, oh my God. Okay. Right. He will never make detective. Holy ever. shit. Yeah, dude. There is no Netflix special coming out for this fucking guy, <laughs> dude. You know? And yeah, he, he missed it. And, and so he goes back and he, they, they pop the trunk and they find the boxes of hollow points and then Did they try to play that up at all like oh they what is this here he, here's <laughs> the thing is they, is they immediately beelined it to me right and they open up this back door and they're like where's the gun and i'm like what gun you know like playing dumb you know right. well what are you got bullets where are the gun and so on the fly me be, you know the hustle mentality dude just wing and ding I tell him, I'm like, I was just at the shooting range yesterday, dude. Like, those are just leftovers. I don't even have a gun. It's at home in my safe, you know? And and sure as shit, dude, like, they search, but they don't find it. Holy shit. And I escape death, dude. Now The, the worst the, fucking cops dude, ever. Dude, here's the trippiest part about this shit, right? Now, keep in mind the reason why I got pulled over. I did not have a valid driver's license, right? I was not legally able to drive. Right. Um, the cops come back after the search. And and they also found the cash, too, because the cash was in my front pocket. So, right. like, when they asked me, what are you doing with all this? I said, this is my paycheck. You know, I was like, I just got paid. 2008. Well, I guess it was kind of. It was, it was just under 2000, yeah. You know, so it wasn't anything, like, crazy. Right. But it was enough to be like, okay, motherfucker, you know, like, you're young. What do you make? But um, anyways, the cop comes back and he's like, okay, you, do you want to pay your bail on spot? And I was like, yep. <laughs> and he's like, do you want me to take it out of the money that's on the trunk? And I was like, yep. And swear to fucking Christ, cost me 50 fucking dollars. <laughs> the dude wrote me my court date on the spot and let me drive the fuck away. I swear to God, dude, I drove the fuck away with your pistol, with my your pistol ounce of and my ounce of crack, crack That's broken right. up, a button away, dude. And I, I was literally the fucked up part was I was literally like two blocks away from where I was dumping it off. So like, did you go ahead and make the deal? I did. That's yeah, it's a, a good drug deal. Yeah, yeah, because I, I, I did fulfill my promise though. Like I literally right. remember, like, okay, this is it, and that, uh, I'm not gonna throw this one out. You know? Right, this like, doesn't count. You yeah, already touched like, this, this one. This is it. Like it's gone. You know, like okay, so I gave it to dude, and I got I got my money out of it, and that that was it. Like I literally stopped selling blow right after that, and that was that was done. Wow, that was a wild episode, right? Uh, did, was it everything that I promised? It was everything in there, right? Oh my goodness! Um, and that's crazy. It was even crazy for me to to conduct that interview, to have that conversation with him, with him sitting across from me, knowing that I've known so much about him and I knew so many of these details. But then to get the more clarified story, the city because most of these conversations we had were always, you know, me and him sitting around smoking a blunt in a car in between, you know, back and forth to a studio or hanging out or whatever in a different environment, but never once did we have a sit down in a, you know, in a quiet studio, one-on-one, -on -one, eye to eye, and really sit down and kind of go through this start to finish. And, uh, I think that's, you know, one of the, uh, dare I say, uh, brilliant aspects of this podcast, uh, <clears throat> uh, is, is the, you know, that engagement, that one-on-one -on -one engagement, that having that conversation, that, that, uh, you know, that, that farming for that mining of those details and that, that, in a, in a intimacy, blah, blah, spit the word out. That intimacy of that conversation, and getting all that extra stuff that uh, you know, even when you know somebody, you don't really know everything. Type conversation. So I hope you enjoyed that as much as I enjoyed that. Uh, I really think you will. That was good. So yeah. Well, uh, what did I leave out? What did I cut out at the end? Because I definitely cut out uh, quite a bit at the end. And uh, basically, it was just him kind of wrapping it up and telling him where he where he's at today. You know, he. Uh, 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 he he got off with that uh you know that near miss coke arrest there at the end, um, and that was kind of like his life lesson you know he learned he learned uh uh you know to change direction and eventually shortly after that he he had a kid you know he had a kid uh, with a relationship that didn't work and he ended up taking care of that kid on his own uh that's that's a fact and I know that and uh, uh the mom kind of went her way for a while while she she's back in the relationship now and, and, you know, 
committing and are, are, are helping, I guess, be a parent. Uh, there for, I think, what do you say? I think it was at least three to five years. He was a single dad, right? And he did the absolute right thing and said, you know what? I can't do this, uh, you know, quote unquote gangster lifestyle anymore. I've got to get it together. I've got to do it right. Uh, he went and uh, he, he got uh, an education, a uh, business degree. He started a, a, uh, a contracting company on his own. That was his first business uh, that he still has to this day. Uh, and now he's moved on and he's doing other types of investment and in the uh, real estate and everything else. And he's uh, becoming uh, relatively successful at it. And, uh, and I'm very proud of him, look up to him and uh, rather embarrassed at myself when I see that, oh, wow, he's done so well. And, and here I am uh, talking into a microphone, trying to trying to make comedy work. But whatever. It's not about me. It's about him. Congrats to him, though. I'm I'm very proud that he's done it, and it, it's it's very impressive to see somebody make that that big of a change, that big circle in life, come back around, and say, you know what, all this stuff is wrong, and uh, I'm gonna be a good dad. I want to do this right. And he said that, you know, he said he said uh, my daughter saved my life. That was something that he said, and uh, I agree with him completely. I mean, it was an immediate change. He uh, he he feels remorseful for a lot of things that he did. Uh, he definitely feels bad for the way that he treated women, you know, uh, in his younger years and feels that his daughter is, is you know, a little bit of a, a wake-up call and a little bit of a punishment because now he's going to have to know what the world is because, you know, as far as how can treat a woman because he was part of that negative. And now he's got to help, you know, protect her from that. And uh, he's he's uh, uh, wide-eyed and very aware of, uh, of uh, you know, what that entails and, and what it can be. So yeah, good, good job, Sean. Congrats. And, uh, I'm very proud of you. I'm glad we're glad we're still friends. Glad I get to see you. I'm glad you're still alive. Uh, cause a lot of our friends that we grew up with, uh, are not. And a lot of them, uh, have, uh, ended up in prison and a lot of them are dead and have died violent deaths. And, uh, so yeah. Um, whew, Okay. But anyway, that was the show. Thank you guys for listening. This was definitely a longer episode. I think we, with the intro and the, the whole episode, I think we broke two hours on this one. So I hope that wasn't too long on together. But uh, I, I think the show justified it. I think it earned it. Uh, I, I think there's enough stuff in there, enough entertainment value in there that it, it maybe if it took you two, two sessions to listen to it, so be it. I didn't want to break it into two episodes. I don't like to do that. And I just want to get it all in one sitting. It's, it's one episode. Boom. There it is. Uh, thank you to my sponsor, uh, simplewebsite.us, simplewebsite.us. Go to them for all your Squarespace uh, uh, building needs. Uh, also, guys, uh, whatever, wherever you're listening to us at, uh, please uh, rate, subscribe, give good positive reviews. Please, if you enjoy the show, please share with other people who you think would also enjoy the show. Please help me build this. Please help me uh, get some more listeners in here, especially right now with my struggles with iTunes. I'm literally uh, m losing access to over half of the podcast listening world right now because I can't get on the iTunes. That's the, the, the big dog. Oops, I dropped my pen. Excuse me. That's the big dog in, in the podcast world as it is right now. And, of course, you can tell by their high-quality uh, customer service. Ugh, whatever. iTunes, get it together, please. Please get it together. Thank you. Whatever. But do all that stuff. But uh, thank you. Simple website. What else? Oh, next episode. We got a very cool next episode. It's going to be out this week as well. Uh, I've got a lady coming in. Her name is Ellie. And uh, she survived almost dying from uh, a flesh eating disease. Yeah, that's going to be a very advertising episode. Uh, she's a very nice lady who I've known. In, uh, she's a comedy fan, and I've known her for quite a while. And she told me her story of, of almost dying from flesh eating disease. And it's a definitely a good one, too. So I'll have that one out, I think, uh, by Thursday. So be ready for that. Whatever, guys. I, I love you all. Take care of yourselves. Keep seeking the truth. Keep doing what you do. I love you. Bye-bye.